Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the October 12th Utility Advisory Commission. We will start with roll call, starting with Commissioner Bowie. Present. We didn't hear you. Present, sorry. Thank you. Um, Commissioner Forcell. Here. Commissioner Metz. Here. Vice Chair Johnston. Here. And I am here as well. So we have a quorum and we can move forward. We do not have any agenda review and revision. So we will go with oral communications from the public. Is there anyone who would like to speak about an item that is not on the agenda? If there is anyone from the public who wishes to speak and you are on Zoom, please raise your hand. If you're on a cell phone, please press star nine. I see no hands, Chair. Thank you. So we will move on to approval of the minutes. Does anyone have any comments on the minutes? I just have one uh, typo, I think, on um, page nine. I think uh, the second paragraph, I think uh, Mr. Hitchens' name is is H I rather than H U. Good catch. I think that's I, correct. That, actually, the same change I now see should be made on page one. Um, instead of Hamilton Hutchinson, I think it's Hitchens. Thank you for that. With those changes, are there any other comments to the minutes? Great, with that, I'll take a motion to accept the minutes with the uh, typo, typo corrections. I'll so move. And do we have a second? Second. Great, okay. And we'll, uh, Commissioner Bowie? Yes. Well, Commissioner Forcell? Yes. Commissioner Metz? Yes. Vice Chair Johnston? Yes. And I also approve the minutes. So we, we have no unfinished business, so we can move to the director report. Thank you, Chair Siegel. Evening, Commissioners. Um, CPAU recently launched uh, WaterSmart. It's an online water management tool to help um, residents and business better understand their water usage and enable them to conserve water and save some money. The portal is open to the city of Palo Alto utility customers and provides access to water um, use charts, personal recommendations for water um, efficiencies, information on available rebates. Um, it also integrates with my CPAU um, portal. It's an online, um, again, an online management tool, um, and it streamlines um, uh, one-time um, sign-in to my CPAU, then you can get to this portal. Um, it will also, um, we will be um, pushing out some promotional information on this and a bill insert in November as well as um, we will be doing um, the same with welcome letters in the early uh, 2023. And uh, it'll be also sending out um, water home reports courtesy of leak um, alerts to single family resident customers. And the home water reports include information on a customer's water usage, comparisons to similar size Palo Alto households and water saving um, tips. Um, so we're pretty excited about this. This has been in the plans for about two years now, and uh, we were able to just launch this. Um, so we're hoping to uh, get some good feedback from, from the community on this. Also too, on October 3rd, council approved a contract with Synergy Company, um, which is um, part of the heat pump water heater um, program. Um, it is a multifamily plus residential energy assistant program um, for heat pump water heaters. Um, Council further approved the um, heat pump water heat program design, eliminates the measures to provide funding for the program, 
Um, it's an opportunity for CPAU to offer electric heat um, pump water heaters at three different affordable options. Um, and that is an all exclusive $2,700 turnkey price, a low price um, turnkey option of $1,500 with a $20 per month fee for five years. Um, it will be that will be put on on the on bill finance um, payment um, or it's self direct um, installation with a rebate of 2300 uh, upon completion once you show that so some um, good opportunities for folks to start moving in if end of life or wanting to starting to um, electrify their homes. Um, this program is going to be a, a great program that we will be moving forward um, on this. Also, too, in October 3rd, Council approved the Sustainability and Climate Action Plan. The goals and the key actions is a summary of the city's work plan underneath the SCAP frame and adopting a resolution to achieve carbon neutrality by 2035. Staff has presented a proposal for the 2022 Building Reach Code for Council's consideration at the upcoming October 17th meter meeting. So more to come on that. <clears throat> A little bit of update on our water supply and drought update. SFPUC is calling again for a voluntary regional um, water, state water reduction. Palo Alto volunteers cutback level is about 8%. The city's taken measures to um, aid in the community and water savings, including increasing education, outreach, more um, stringent water use restrictions, such as limiting irrigation to two days um, per week except for the health of trees and, and uh, non-turf um, planting the city. We also are um, just hired a water waste coordinator to help us in these efforts um, so that we can actually go out and, and educate um, customers um, with this individual. The action seemed to be making an impact for January through April after the driest January through March and re uh, recorded history, Palo Alto usage was about 17% above the water budget from SFPUC. Palo Alto has now reduced um, water down to about 7% above the water budget. And for months of July through September, we reduced water usage about 10% of the baseline for 2020. So we're moving in the right direction. It's, it's slow. Um, and uh, I think that uh, there's a lot of room um, for movement here that we need to um, get more information out um, to customers. Um, and I think with this uh, new um, software, um, we'll improve that communication platform that we'll be able to uh, have customers actually look at on time um, billing and what their usage um, will be. Also, as it will also register any kind of leakage um, ahead of time. If the customers are, are seeing spikes in, that, in their um, billing, it'll show on the graphs that they'll be able to pull up. Also, too, is um, the city has been recognized with an honorable mention for the 2020 Mayor's Climate Protection Award. The award highlighted a multifamily gas furnace and heat pump retrofit program, which will reduce city's greenhouse gas emissions, a case study for future electrification and multifamily buildings. The Conference of the Mayors made the announcement at the annual meeting in Reno, Nevada on June 3rd. And Mayor Burt and the city staff received the award and plaque and special orders the day in ceremony at the September 27th meeting. So we're pretty proud about that. Um, <clears throat> tonight, um, there are uh, some upcoming events tonight um, from 6.30 to 7.30, Sunshade's information um, workshop is going on. October 15th, we're making a better choices in our home um, workshop. And then on October the 18th at 7 p.m., we're also doing another landscape design 101 and how um, folks can get started on uh, their landscaping. And then on November the um, 1st at 7 p.m. is lawn conservation of 101. Also too is that um, on September 29th, um, I wanna thank Vice Chair um, Johnson, Commissioner Bowie and Councilmember Cormack for attending the boards and commissions recognition night. Um, I also, I uh, want to thank all of you for volunteering your time. I know we ask an awful lot of your time. It's very important that, uh, you know, that, uh, that you're um, included in everything that we do. And I know it takes a lot of time away from you. So again, with that, I really appreciate um, all your efforts and all your help that you give us um, throughout the year. 
Also, too, is that um, I received an email from Mr. Jeff Hoyle pointing out that we used to report out our re reliability numbers and our quarterly reports. As you can see tonight, you received a quarterly report. There were no reliability numbers in that. And uh, this was um, an oversight of myself. Um, we uh, typically uh, put those um, numbers in there, um, in the reports, and uh, it was just an oversight. So I've uh, spoken to um, staff and that uh, we will be making sure that um, as the quarterly reports come out, uh, we will be giving out our reliability numbers um, for the electric as well as um, we'll talk a little bit about some of the reliability pieces that we have for the gas and for the water side as well that we used to um, put in uh, those quarterly reports. So again, that was just an oversight for myself that uh, we did not um, put that in there this time around. My apologies. And with that, that concludes my report. Questions? Any commission? I, I, I just wanted to uh, commend staff on the um, the water smart tool. I was playing around with it this weekend. It's great. It's just so intuitive and informative and um, really great job there. That's great. I will uh, I will make sure to pass that on to, to staff. We were pretty excited about it. Uh, it took us a little bit of time to get uh, where it is today uh, working with our vendor, but uh, we think that it's going to be a great tool for us. So thank you. Yeah, and then one other thought just occurred to me as you were going through the many programs that are being offered right now, has there ever been a thought of putting a fixed day of the week or month or whatever on calendar so that if the public, uh, public kind of gets used to knowing that there would be a program or maybe there's one for water and one for electricity or whatever makes sense, but something where, Maybe there could be a regular scheduled time, and if it's not going to happen, that's announced. But just to make it a little easier for the public to participate and know ahead of time. Just my quick thought on that is, is that I think that probably um, you know we can um, look at um, maybe creating a page um, on on the website portion of it um, in utilities, um, and that. Um, you know, maybe what we can do is we can look at what it, whatever the events are for the month. Um, so maybe having an event um, page. Um, so that way there, uh, folks would know it. Um, since we we meet usually on the first Wednesday, but, you know, maybe we can make sure that we update it on the um, before the, the first of each month. I'm sure we can do that. Any other commissioner comments? Thank you, Director Batchelor. We'll now move on to the first item of new business on the agenda, which is adopting the resolution authorizing use of teleconferencing for our meetings during the COVID state of emergency. I think we're all pretty familiar with this resolution now. Oh, excuse me, are there any uh, public comments? Chair Siegel, um, unfortunately, in the Zoom screen, we could not see that we did have a hand raised during oral communications. Okay, so should we take that now? Can you hear me? Okay, can I have like about three minutes and 15 seconds? Uh, my comments are a follow-up to the recent residential municipal fiber presentation at City Council and input to the Utilities Commission's colleagues memo, which I hope can be improved. When asked for competitive examples, Magellan cited a few municipalities who had successful fiber offerings. They cited Cedar Falls, Iowa, which has a 90% take rate. However, they failed to mention that Cedar Falls completed their fiber build out in 1996 with no competitors. They also mentioned Longmont as being very similar to Palo Alto but failed to mention they had started offering service in 2014. Unfortunately, those are not valid comparisons because they launched service much earlier than Palo Alto will and without competition. Not all municipal networks managed to succeed, even when backed by government subsidies. A report by Penn Law Professor Christopher Yu and Timothy Fengen finds that of the 20 municipalities studied, that 11 that were of the 20 that were studied, 
uh, that report financial results of their broadband operations separately, 11 generated negative cash flow. Seven others would take 100 years to return their cost on investment. At best, municipal broadband, broadband projects have a very mixed track record and are not reliably successful. When Magellan was asked to exi cite examples of failure, they did not provide a single example. One well-known failure is Provo, Utah, which lost 8 million before selling its fiber network to Google for $1. They still owe 39 million that they must pay off. Another well-known failure is Burlington, Vermont. Another failure is Kentucky Wired, which estimated it would cost 350 million and currently has cost has already reached 1.5 billion. Focusing on Palo Alto's plan, I believe the take rates do not fully account for AT&T fiber. The survey results are likely biased towards folks who have a poor internet service. Thus the estimate that AT&T has 25 to 30% service offering coverage right now is likely low. Furthermore, projections do not take into account AT&T fiber growth over the next three to five years. I got AT&T fiber year and a half, a year and a half ago and it delivers everything Palo Alto Fiber promises. With 90% of residents served by overhead lines, the barriers for expansion of AT&T are low. I also spoke to a neighbor in Midtown who has underground service and also has AT&T Fiber already. The real problem statement should be how to ensure most Palo Altans have access to fiber without a risky, large upfront investment that may never be paid off if projected rate take rates are not met nor or there are cost overruns. Outsourcing is a good step in the right direction in terms of lowering costs, but an even better one would be to partner with an outside vendor to offer competing service to AT&T and have them build out and own the residential infrastructure themselves, such as Atherton Fiber. Palo Alto has 30 million in its fiber fund. They could offer subsidies to entice another service provider, but then they would, and then they would not risk borrowing money they would not be able to pay back. Thank you for giving me this time to speak. Do we have any public comments about the resolution authorizing use of teleconferencing? If there's anyone who wishes to speak during the item number one, please raise your hand or hit star nine on your cell phone. I don't think we have any public comments. Any commissioner comments? I move we approve the resolution. Do I have a second? Second. Okay, I'll start online. Commissioner Bowie? Yes. Commissioner Scharf? Yes. Vice Chair Johnston? Yes. Commissioner Metz? Yes. Commissioner Forcell? Yes. And I vote yes as well. So we'll continue in a hybrid meeting setup. Next, we'll move to discussion and update of sanitary sewer main replacement acceleration alternatives. Do we have any public comment on this? If anyone wishes to speak on item two, please raise your hand or hit star nine on your cell phone. I don't believe we have any public comments. So will we have a presentation? Uh, good evening, yes. Um, give me a second and I'll get the presentation going. Um, so good evening, Commission. My name is Matt Zuka. I'm the Assistant Director of Utilities for Water, Gas and Wastewater um, Engineering and Operations. Uh, we're here tonight to present information regarding um, alternatives for increasing the uh, rate of sewer main replacement um, uh, within the city. 
Uh, this presentation is a continuation of one uh, from April of this year where staff presented to UAC on the reasons and the need for increasing the rate of sewer main replacement. And at that time, staff committed to returning to UAC in the fall with rate implications, which is the primary objective for tonight. So tonight, we're not going to go too much into, uh, into too much depth on the need, and we'll focus more on the rate uh, rates themselves. Um, uh, with me tonight uh, in support of this effort is Karen North. She's the Assistant Director of Public Works, and uh, one of her many responsibilities is for uh, the Regional Water Quality Control Plant. Uh, Lisa Belier is a Senior Resource Planner with the Utilities Department and Sylvia Santos, Engineering Manager for Water, Gas, and Wastewater in the Utilities Department. So they'll be available to answer any questions that the Commissioner or the public might have. Um, a little bit of back, thank you. A little bit of background uh, on the infrastructure, the wastewater collection system infrastructure. So the city sewer system came online in 19, uh, 1890, excuse me. Uh, there's about 216 miles of sewer mains in the collection system. And since about 1990, we've been in the process of implementing uh, an infrastructure program to change out some of those mains. Um, the, uh, since then, 36% or 78 miles of the sewer mains have been replaced. Um, and uh, there's about 138 miles of sewer mains remaining. Quick question. Yeah. In the map, is the dark green that which has already been replaced or that which remains? Was just about to get to that one. Uh, so yes, the dark green is uh, what has been replaced um, and the light green is actually what is remaining still. Of the remaining 138 miles uh, of original pipe, the majority of it was installed between the 50s and the 70s. Uh, it's mainly what we call VCP or vitrified clay pipe. Uh, it has a life, of a life expectancy of around 100 years. It's not a precise number, but that's what we uh, use for planning purposes. Uh, our current rate of replacement is about one mile per year. So simple math at that rate, we're about 138 years to replace, out, uh, to re uh, replace the remaining pipes. So the oldest pipe in the system or the, the 1970s pipe would be approximately 190 years old at that rate. Um, and it, yeah, I think staff's perspective is that that's just not a prudent um, uh, rate of replacement to sustain. Uh, what is the, 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 what we think the right rate? Well, um, you know, for the 100 year replacement cycle, we have about 55 years remaining. That works out to be around two and a half miles per year. Again, it's not an exact science. This is a, a planning number. Um, but at that rate, the last pipe would be about 107 years old, assuming we, we go to 2.5 miles per year, uh, starting immediately. Uh, immediately being we start the design and move into construction right away. Um, how did we get here? Um, we've actually been in the past, we've been at 2.5 miles per year historically, um, but a combination of things happened and about starting in about the 2010s, we had some retirements and staffing changes that um, uh, amongst the engineers and inspectors that transitioned and disrupted some of our regular rhythm for CIP implementation. Uh, we had a major gas uh, project where we were replacing old brittle ABS pipe um, that took a lot of our resources as well. And uh, we also had a major project downtown that uh, involved a lot of extra time. So during this period of time, basically um, uh, investment was low in the wastewater side the reserves started accumulating. And as a result, there was sort of a downward pressure on rates because we were accumulating reserves. We weren't spending them on the wastewater enterprise. Uh, mm -hmm. As a result, right now, the rates won't support getting back up to 2.5 miles per year. Um, and, you know, <coughs> add on top of that, the last couple of years of pandemic, um, and uh, we, we sort of are where we are today. Um, uh, so obviously, that we wanted to hold the rates down to the community during the pandemic and did not um, uh, shift some of the investment over into CIP. So now that we're exiting the pandemic, um, we think it's time to sort of revisit the investment rate in the collection system and uh, consider what might be a more sustainable uh, uh, rate. Yeah. So can you clarify, you just described a slower pace of replacement that sounded like started in 2010 because of retirements and short staffing in the downtown project. But on this slide, it says that we were at two and a half miles a year until 2020. And it looks like there was just one year oh, yeah, where it, it dipped. It, it sort of was a, a gradual decrease over time uh, is my understanding. Uh, it wasn't a, a, an exact stop. So we had we had transitions and issues start happening. So from about 2010 to 2020, it was declining from two and a half Correct. to somewhere close to one. Correct. Got it, thanks. Correct. Thank you for that. Um, in developing the costs uh, uh, that went into the rate forecast that you'll see tonight, um, we basically estimated the construction 
um, uh, of the existing sewer with what we call high density or HDP, high density polyethylene pipe using an open trench or a pipe bursting method. Um, we did consider alternative technologies that might be less costly in the short term, um, such as lining the existing pipe. The reason that's not included in the rates um, from a technology and a cost standpoint is that we feel there's a couple of issues with that uh, technology. One, the bulk of our collection system pipe is uh, small diameter. And when we line it, we reduce the overall diameter and the, the, thus the capacity of, of the pipe, um, uh, which is not the direction we wanna be going with it. The second part of it is, while that technology might be less expensive on a per foot basis, we don't expect it to have the same life cycle duration as a brand new pipe. So we're, looking, we're really looking at moving away from uh, managing our assets on the replacement costs and we're looking at them on the life cycle cost. We'll obviously continue to look for um, long-term solutions. Um, anything that we can do to keep those costs, uh, put a downward pressure on construction costs, we'll do. Um, but right now we have assumed a, what I would say is a, a, a relative, a prudently conservative way of replacing the infrastructure, if you will. Um, when we compare ourselves to other utilities, uh, we're actually not in a bad spot to start with as a basis for um, where we're going to be moving to potentially. Uh, so in evaluating uh, Palo Alto's wastewater waste, we also benchmarked ourselves against other nearby agencies. Um, city of Palo Alto on the residential side is about 28% below our comparison cities, um, and we're slightly above commercial rates at 8% above. Um, a 2018 sewer rate study found that Palo Alto has lower monthly single family than 25 agencies that were evaluated in that study. 22 of those were in San Mateo County, three were in Santa Clara County. And we do also know that other treatment plants in the Bay Area are going to be doing similar upgrades that we have planned at our plant. Um, there's a lot of nutrient removal and other regulations that are forcing agencies to invest in their treatment plants. So we expect there to be upward pressure on rates in nearby agencies uh, as well. Um, on the collection system side, there's really not as good a comparison to benchmark ourselves against other systems. There's so much variability in uh, the conditions, the uh, historical rates of replacement, um, the amount of new development that's been going on yeah, in, within a community. Um, but we do, we do believe that um, from an overall benchmarking standpoint, we're in a pretty good spot so that even with some of the uh, rate increases that are being uh, contemplated tonight, that we shouldn't be moving too much when uh, looking against our comparator cities. Um, so how do we fund 2.5 miles per year of investment? Um, so obviously the challenge now is of course that we're trying to increase rates for multiple reasons. We have a collection system CIP that we're adding on. Uh, we have some historic uh, investment at the regional water quality control plant that is uh, already uh, forecasted. And all of this is while we're exiting the pandemic. So the uh, chart here shows what was included in this year's um, uh, financial forecast. Uh, so this is sort of sets the baseline expectation of the already anticipated rates at the current one mile per year main replacement um, uh, rate that we are, have been implementing recently. Uh, to give explain this chart a little bit, um, the light blue and light green represent the operating costs at the treatment plant and then within the collection system respectively. The dark blue is the uh, uh, treatment capital and debt financing um, that you can see expanding sort of in the 2028 and onward timeframe. And then the orange color is the collection system capital. Um, that investment rate again represents the one mile per year. So as a baseline in the financial plan, we were already anticipating sort of a 5% rate increase to capture operating and capital. Um, and uh, the percentages tonight will be um, uh, using incorporating this baseline already. So we have four options tonight uh, to talk about how we're going to fund the 2.5 miles per year of investment, uh, sort of a 1A, 1B, um, and uh, a 2 and a 3. So uh, alternative, alternative one is an immediate move to 2.5 miles per year with construction in 2024. Uh, under that scenario, the last sewer line replaced would be 107 years old. And the, the, the A and the B is really how we pay for that. So uh, option 1A would be a PAYGO financing where there would be a substantial short-term rate increase to um, set the rates where necessary in order to have the cash coming in to be able to pay out both design and construction. Uh, follow, and option 1B is a, more of a debt financing um, using either uh, bonds or potentially an SRF loan, state revolving fund loan uh, to mitigate the actual impact to rates. 
Uh, alternative two is transitioning to 2.5 miles per year over four years. So construction would start in 2026. Last sewer line in that alternative would be 109 years old. And then alternative three is a, a slower transition still with construction in 2034. And the last sewer line replaced uh, will be 113 years old. So you can see the al alternatives are really sort of how quickly do we get there? Uh, time is sort of the variable in the three. Um, at the end of the day, uh, we're, we're targeting all of the same infrastructure. Um, so going into alternative 1A, um, this is the 2.5 miles per year with PAYGO financing. Um, and we say finance a five mile project because what we do typically is we'll design one year uh, and we'll construct the next. So while it's 2.5 miles per year, we tend to do that sort of bi biannually, if you will, um, where we're constructing every other year. So uh, uh, two, two um, relatively large rate increases in 2024 of 15 and 12%. Um, in 2024 and 2025, uh, followed by 4% increases um, uh, for the near term and then three in the outer years. Uh, this gets us uh, cash to be able to then pay um, for the construction starting uh, again in, in the fiscal year 2024. Uh, same, same implementation rate, if you will. So same construction start year, same uh, age of last pipe replaced, but this would be um, a, a debt financed alternative. Um, and here we're basically assuming that we would uh, uh, issue bonds to debt finance the, the capital um, to get us to, to, to the uh, five miles every other, every other year. This keeps the rates down to about a 7% sustained between up until about 2030, where they drop from there. Um, it's important to note on this option that while the percentages do, do come down in the outer years, the rates are going to be higher on not only a percentage basis, but um, the overall amount of uh, interest that a bond alternative would pay out over this option is estimated to be around $11 million more over the 30 years than uh, the alternative 1A, which is a cash finance option. If we were fortunate enough to get a, what we call an SRF loan, um, which have currently have reduced interest rates, that could drop to about $3.4 million in interest, but there's no guarantee that we would qualify. Uh, SRF loans, these, these types of projects tend not to be the most competitive under SRF loans as they're prioritizing the funding. Um, so we've assumed some buy-in finances. Yes. What does SRF stand Sorry, for? State Resolve Revolving Fund Loan. It's a, a, a loan program uh, issue um, that's managed by the state of California. And what is the likely rate on such a loan? Uh, it's a good question. About 1.6%. And what that's up from about from what it was recently. Um, they're pretty low, but they're, they're, it's sometimes difficult to get for these kind of projects. I, that was the question I was going to ask. Sounds like they're not guaranteed. We're not guaranteed to be able to get one. Correct. There's a sort of a ranking priority depending upon what type of project you're you're implementing, and then they have a fixed amount of money that they dole out um, uh, every cycle. And so, if depending on how your project stacks up, you either will or won't. So what we've what we've assumed is, uh, and what you see here is more of the bond financing option. If we can do it for cheaper, we would. Um, but this is what we would need to do to support the higher interest rate approach. And uh, how does the SRF loan affect the, the city's ability to, you know, on other borrowings? Does it affect our credit rating? Um, I would imagine that it would affect it like any other loan. Um, it's no different. It's not quite the bond itself. It's not a bond. It is an actual loan uh, from the state. The payback period is less. It's 20 years typically as opposed to a bond finance is 30. Um, but yeah, it would be factored in, I would imagine, no differently than any other, any other debt. Um, so that's alternative 1B. Uh, alternative 2, this is a transition to 2.5 miles per year over uh, an assumed four-year period of time. So here we're, we're starting construction in 2026. Um, uh, last pipe replaced would be 109 years old. Um, and as you can see from this chart, the uh, percent rates now are down to 9% for the next three years and then 8% in the 2027. So single digits um, and uh, in the outer years, we're, we're back down to the previously assumed 3% in, um, in the financial forecast. Uh, again, the main, the main variable between all of these alternatives is time. Uh, and then moving into alternative three, uh, we're, we're now basically pushing construction out um, fairly substantially to 2034. Um, where we are maintaining the 5% rate increase 
And um, in the financial forecast that you saw earlier, the outer years were three. So we're in those outer years now going to five instead of three to start accumulating cash to then be able to pay for the design and construction. Uh, here, the last pipe replaced is 113 years old. Uh, the percentages are one way of looking at this. Um, so what we've tried to do with this slide is show a slightly different way. Um, the upper table here are the percentages that uh, were previously shown on previous slides. Um, so alternative 1A, you can see, was the immediate pay go at 15% and 12% uh, down to alternative 3, which is the more the transitioning slowly at 5. Um, and then the, the second table shows the um, uh, monthly change to the average residential bill. Um, so this is the actual tangible effect to the average consumer, if you will, within the city. And so under alternative 1A at the 15% per year, uh, that's about a $6.69, $6 and monthly uh, increase. Um, moving down to alternative three, which at 5% would be about a $2.23 um, cent increase. Uh, so this is just a slightly different way of looking at the, the percentages. Um, we, it's not just residential, however, on the sewer side. So we also have uh, commercial and restaurant. Uh, so the same table at the top, which is the percentages of the alternatives that you've seen in the previous slides for commercial, um, you know, the, looking at the 15%, it would be a, an average impact of $17 and 49 cents. Um, for restaurants who pay both on, you know, have a slightly different rate structure, um, it would be $104. Um, and that's also partly due because the base rate is, uh, um, if you just do the math, is around $700 a month on, on average for a restaurant. So the 15% applied to that base ends up being a larger number. So in summary of the, uh, the four options um, before you tonight, uh, we have the option one, alternative one, which is the PAYGO, 15% uh, and 12% rate increases in, in fiscal year 24 and 25. Uh, the debt financing attenuates that somewhat, um, but does result in a fairly substantial interest rate payment and um, uh, higher rates in the outer years by uh, on average 3%. Um, we transitioned it a little bit more slowly over four years. Uh, it does um, extend the, the last pipe by a couple. Um, so it's 109 years old now instead of 107. But it does keep the rates to 9% per year in, in the near term uh, between 2024 and 2027. And then finally, alternative three is transition even more slowly uh, construction in 2034. It keeps the rates at 5%, the trade-off being time and then the age of the pipe uh, in, the, in the collection system. Uh, and then I think uh, the preliminary projection uh, or sort of staff's preference on uh, when we look at the alternatives um, is uh, we think alternative two kind of balances uh, all these competing interests uh, as best as possible. It, it, it raises rates over four years, uh, keeps the largest increase to less than 10%. Uh, again, we believe that we're gonna remain competitive compared to surrounding agencies with these rate increases, just because we understand some of the, the pressures on cost and price for everybody in the Bay Area. Uh, on the plant level and on the collection system. Uh, the, the compromise of, of 109 versus 107 is within, we think, the noise of the estimate for the age of the infrastructure. Um, it may require future adjustments. I mean, the one thing is, I, I don't know that we've ever been able to stay on top of construction cost inflation. Um, and so we'll continue to monitor it like we have so far. Um, and you know, if, if uh, additional adjustments, if, if construction cost inflation exceeds what we assumed, we, we might be having uh, additional conversations in order to keep that pace up. But avoiding bond financing also sort of better aligns the decisions we think, um, and also the rate increases uh, of less than 10%, you know, we feel are, are more likely um, to be uh, politically palatable. Um, with that being said, we will continue to also look for funding opportunities. I mean, you know, a, a good example is the Infrastructure Investment and Job Act, uh, Jobs Act. Um, staff did just recently apply for uh, over nine, almost $9 million grant under that uh, act for um, gas main replacement. Um, uh, hopefully, we'll find out sort of beginning of next year whether we're successful. So if we can find other sources of funding, certainly to help mitigate some of these costs and the rate increases, we will. And we're actively looking into that as we move forward. Um, the benefits of this sort of investment in this manner, uh, I will say it's a really nice position to be contemplating and managing um, uh, our assets like this on a, on a life cycle basis where it's proactive rather than reactive. We're not just out there fixing things as they break, but we're trying to stay you know, on top of it and have a good long term planning horizon on it. Um, there is a benefit to sanitary sewer overflows as well. Um, by, by, as a sewer pipe degrades, there is an increased risk for SSOs. 
um, which can result in fines, other costs, um, you know, litigation. Um, uh, some of the environmental NGOs have sued our, some of our neighboring agencies over SSOs. So there is a benefit there. Um, uh, sort of an interesting benefit that may not be uh, self-evident is that as, as it's, it, this is also sort of a resiliency issue with respect to sea level rise. Um, the, as, as, as sea levels rise, we expect the groundwater table to rise as well. And a collection system that leaks and has a lot of infiltration from groundwater is going to have higher inflows at the plant uh, and higher peak flows. And dealing with that hydraulically at the plant is costly as well. Um, so the, the more watertight and the better uh, um, able our collection system is to withstand uh, the, what we call INI, uh, inflow and infiltration, um, we'll, we'll, we will see some benefit of, of that at the plant. Um, and I will add that there's a couple of other elements. You know, we, we have seen things um, as conservation has, uh, water conservation has improved. Uh, we know that the ratio of water that's flowing and scouring solids in the, in the sewer system to the solids has changed. We're, we're not using as much water for the same amount of solids. And we see that accumulating. So having pipe that is able to carry those solids better um, is going to be better for us uh, in the long run to maintain it. Um, as well as we know there are other um, changes in consumer behavior around gray water systems and other things that will be replacing this with pipe that although the, a lot of the pipe in the system is already relatively tolerant to that uh, kind of use, certainly what we're putting into the system uh, will be as well. Um, so this is a, a good way to uh, adjust for a lot, of, a lot of things that we see coming down the pipe. No pun intended. Uh, totally unintentional. Um, so next steps, um, where are we? This, this table lays out where we are tonight uh, to uh, June of 2023 when council would adopt uh, uh, final rates. Um, so this isn't gonna be the last bite at the apple, so to speak, I guess is the point of the slide. Uh, we're requesting feedback from the commission tonight. We'll be taking your feedback and basically the same presentation to the finance committee uh, in November. And then from there, based upon that combined feedback, it would go into sort of our preliminary financial forecast um, which will be back to UAC and finance and then the final uh, financial plans, uh, which again comes back to UAC and finance before ultimate approval by council and uh, anticipated to be June of 2023. Um, so with that, uh, we're requesting feedback tonight on uh, sort of the preference from staff uh, or any other of the four options that have been uh, discussed tonight and the transition to 2.5 miles per year. Um, and uh, I will turn it over for questions. Thank you, Mr. Zuka. Do I have any commissioner? Yes, Vice Chair Johnston. So just a, a couple of questions. I mean, um, you talked about, I can't remember what, sanitary sewer overflows. Um, how often do we have that? Um, Good question. Uh, and they, they can occur at a couple of different locations. So the a couple of the main source in, in Palo Alto are uh, from the laterals um, uh, going into the mains, but we can have them uh, occurring in the mains themselves. So that's a situation where we have um, some accumulation of, it could be someone put something in the sanitary sewer inappropriately, or it could be accumulation of solids and then ends up backing up and overflowing. Um, uh, the danger of those is when they actually hit a creek uh, and they go over and we, we, uh, and, and we call that a sort of a category one and it goes into the water of the United States. I would say that um, uh, while I don't have a specific number, we could certainly provide that information. Uh, we're responding to those fairly frequently. Unfortunately, they don't, re they don't reach the creek or the right of way that often. Um, so, but, uh, but are uh, these caused by leaks in the pipe or are they caused by blockages because somebody's put something down there they shouldn't have? Both. So what happens is a blockage might slow the water flow down. And then when we have a rain event, for example, the leaky pipe allows the water to come in okay. and then it backs up. Right. So it's a combination of factors. Because I'm trying to assess how, how much uh, danger we're in with, with leaks from old pipes. Mm -hmm. that's, that's kind of the issue here, right? Mm -hmm. um, it, it, do we have a way of, of detecting uh, whether a, a pipe is, is likely to fail before it actually fails. So we have a program where we go through and we TV the uh, pipes and we look for um, what we call uh, the displacements, basically. Are they broken? What's the category? We rank them and then we put them into our overall capital program for any specific places where they've broken. Um, we can target those locations also for enhanced cleaning in the future to try to prevent. So one of the ways to prevent SSOs 
is to do a very aggressive cleaning program. And we have a very aggressive cleaning program that has gone a long way towards avoiding having to do substantial replacement um, by, by, by keeping it clean, it flows smoothly and you're able to, to pass sort of the, the liquids and solids down the pipe. Um, so it is a combination. Uh, and yeah, so the CCTV, uh, we rank them. We then try to fix the ones that are, that are broken. Um, we also CCTV the laterals whenever we have SSOs and we try to figure out what's causing those. But really cameras and inspection is the best tool that we have to figure so out how to address it. So you can prioritize the most dangerous Correct. pipes in terms Correct. of the... And then we have some repair. cases where the pipes are so degraded where we can't get the camera down the pipe any further. And so we're sort of operating blind and it gets onto the list pretty quickly. That's a clue. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, okay. Well, I, uh, I think those are, well, I guess one other question is just when, when we replace pipe, are we replacing with pipe of the same diameter or are we increasing the, the diameter to increase capacity? Good question. Uh, there's no hard and fast rule. We wouldn't necessarily replace a pipe for with larger diameter unless we had a reason um, because it's just more money. Uh, so if um, in general, we're replacing vitrified clay with HDPE uh, and we would try to maintain at least the same internal diameter. We are in the process of undertaking a, a master plan update where we and we have a flow model where we can model this and we can say, has development happened in an area? Have the flows increased in an area? Do we need to increase the pipe diameter size? But we would do that based on data, not just arbitrarily, you know, across the system. <clears throat> those are all the questions. I've got some comments, but I'll save those. Or do you, should I? Yeah. Okay. So in, in general, I've been uh, in favor of making sure that our maintenance program is you know, adequate to cover um, uh, you know, the, the useful life of, so I think it's important to get back to two and a half miles a year. Um, and and as, I, as I think everybody, that's what your proposal is, is just a question of how fast we get there. Correct. Um, and I, I certainly, uh, the 15% the in rate increase I thought was um, a little bit startling and I would like to avoid that. And I'm comforted by what you're saying that we can kind of detect the pipes that are most likely to fail. And so um, it sounds like uh, postponing replacement for a couple of years while we do this transition isn't necessarily gonna lead to a lot more leaks because we can take some steps to, to make sure we're going after the most uh, uh, vulnerable pipes first. Correct. So, I mean, I, I, um, I'd certainly agree that we don't, that I, I wouldn't uh, propose alternatives one, either one A or one B. I wouldn't like to, to borrow money for this. I, and I'm now I'm debating between two. I understand the recommendation, but it sounds like we, we could live with three if we can, if we can, um, accurately identify the vulnerable pipes. Yeah, I would say that we don't CCTV everything every year. Um, we, we go out there with the program and certainly we have a plan around, um, if you just take the downtown, for example, with uh, a lot of the restaurants that would contribute what we call fat, soil and greases. And right. those tend to uh, be a major source of SSOs as well. Um, we, we clean those pipes much more frequently than we do, say uh, your, your average residential street. Um, so while we're able to do that, we also, um, uh, the, the um, uh, the getting, getting to 2.5 within a reasonable amount of time allows us to get more into the life cycle element and the way we manage the infrastructure. Um, so that while the, the hundred years isn't a magic number, the further we push that out, the more likely we're going to find severely deteriorated infrastructure, not today, but in the outer years that then might have to get brought forward at significant additional expense. So it's kind of a risk that, uh, you know, while it's not a, number, a huge number of years between 107, let's say, or 109 and 113, that extra five or 10 is going to be, you know, 113 year old infrastructure, and it's going to be pretty bad. So what, what the SSOs look like at that point in time would not match what they look like today. That's a good point. Okay. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Yeah. Commissioner Bowie. Yes. Um, so I, I believe they were called the the intrusion, the IIE events. Uh, sorry to interrupt you, but it's uh, if you could raise your volume, that would be helpful. Okay. Um, let me see. 
can you hear me? Okay, if I just sit a little closer. Can you maybe raise the volume on your computer? Hold on. I don't want to create the window if I do something wrong. Can you hear me a little better now? Much. Okay. I hope I'm not. Let me know if it's booming because I can also put it down. Okay. Um, the question is about the infiltration events that you mentioned um, as sort of a future potential with climate change and sea level rise. Um, I think I heard that the problem there is that they have a cost on the plant. Is that, uh, what, what's the sort of order of magnitude of those costs and is it comparable to the rate increases that are proposed? Yeah, it, that's a good question. It's really hard to quantify um, because the A, uh, while climate change, you know, um, is sort of an evolving science, obviously, the we don't know the actual direct implication on groundwater levels. And so um, uh, it's very difficult to model how that is gonna change. We know sort of qualitatively uh, the mechanics and the dynamics of how it would work. Um, what I can say is that hydraulics at the plant are a lot more expensive because you're dealing with mechanical infrastructure, the pipes and the pumps and the concrete and that kind of thing. So uh, anything that we can do sort of qualitatively out in the system, we know is going to have a benefit. It's just extremely difficult to predict uh, or estimate the order of magnitude of the benefit. Um, so those are some of the intangibles that we tossed up there, I, I think, as uh, more qualitative um, uh, benefits of, of the, uh, the replacement program. Okay. And then a few months ago, we were looking at some of the resilience studies that had gone on, and there were some maps of inundation and, and sea level rise and its impact on groundwater. It seems as though it would be possible to coordinate a, with that map, looking at the upgrades as they're moving through the system or the replacements moving through the system to mitigate some of that risk, um, to kind of prioritize predicted groundwater levels? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we are going to be undertaking a master plan update here in the next couple of years as well. That'll involve going out into the collection system, uh, uh, obtaining sort of data on the rate of inflow and infiltration that we're seeing in the collection system now, as opposed to back in 2006 when the last master plan was done. Um, so we'll be able to have, we'll have updated information on that. And you know, when we retain the consultants, we can talk about, you know, what are the reasonable ways of trying to estimate that? Um, and how can we uh, there might be some prioritization that we can do as well as we go into the into the main replacement part of it, where how do we prioritize those sections that are we know are going to be substantially under groundwater, um, given given sea level rise and the changes in elevation. Um, so that's that's part of the analysis to be you know to, to be determined for sure. Uh, we just don't have a, a, a quantifiable estimate on it right now. And it'll probably be a range. It wouldn't be a number. We would probably have some range of like, well, here's your what we call I and I today. We don't exactly know what it'll be in the future, but if you were to change the groundwater by a foot, it would go to here. If you were to change it by two feet, it would go to here. And we at least start bracketing the problem. Okay. So it sounds like between the ability to plan around it and the uncertainty, um, it's something that we can mitigate, but also cost-wise, if we do not mitigate it, it it's a it is, it's a it's Exactly. It's definitely a cost that we're going to have to bear somewhere because when, when we have a storm come in, then the plant's going to have to be able to handle that increased hydraulic you know, flow. So um, uh, we're going to plant, we're going to, we're going to deal with that increase, that increased flow one way or another, either mitigating for it with, by, by um, sort of not quite leak proofing, but by improving the, the, the collection system or being able to handle the hydraulic loading at the plant itself. Thank you. Commissioner Forsell. Hey, um, let's see, just a couple of questions. The, the focus of this um, presentation has been on sort of managing rate increases, but I'm curious, are there any other factors that should be taken into account when, when thinking about how soon to restart? You mentioned that the reason we, our, our rate of main report placement had slowed down was some retirements. Um, like we're not gonna do the downtown project again, but you know, is staff ready to go if we, if we go with one A or one B or does, the, or does the utility actually need a couple of years to get to the point where it could resume 
the higher rate of, of main replacement. No, I think we're in a pretty good spot to be able to take on the additional uh, main replacement rate at the moment. So I, I don't I'm, I'm, I don't anticipate any any obstacles. It will, it'll take us a, a little bit of time to get ramped up for sure. Um, but uh, I, I think we have the, the bandwidth given the workload to uh, be able to take it on. Got it. Um, and then my other question is, how does inflation play into these, these um, rate? Yeah projections so good question uh we, we 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 tried to be what i would call prudently pessimistic without being excessively pessimistic because that has an implication on rates um so uh the the it, construction cost inflation is assumed to be 5.4 percent so more than historic cpi but not quite as much as what we would be seeing in recent inflation um and that's over a much longer period of time um so we, we well, we've seen some recent infrastructure inflation obviously much greater than that over the, the planning horizon of this, that was sort of the assumption. Um, I would say that I've been doing this for 30 years. I don't think anybody has ever set rates one time and then never had to come back and revisit construction cost inflation. Uh, and if they have, I'm not aware of it. So, um, you know, we tried to be again, prudently pessimistic without having an undue effect on, I mean, we could, we could it could be 20 and 18% with a different cost inflation number, and that's even less palatable, right? So uh, we think the 5.4 is reasonable given the past, um, but uh, it definitely is a variable. Yeah, um, that makes sense. So I guess my, um, I only have a couple of comments. One is that it, it I think options 1A, 1B, and two are all completely reasonable. Um, I, I think the much more important thing is to, Get back on track doing two and a half. So I'm, I'm. It's great that staff brought this, you know, up as as a need. And and my greater concern would be, what mechanisms are in place to keep a drifting off, you know, over the course of a decade from happening again if similar circumstances arose. Like, is is there anything? Are there any mechanisms available to ensure that we keep the pace of five miles every two years and and don't find ourselves at another. 10, 15 years down the road in a similar series of meetings? Yeah, no, excellent question. Yeah. I think that the, the answer to that is that, you know, I think we have a, um, now that, assuming this moves forward and, and, and gets adopted, being on a sort of a life cycle uh, type of pace, um, knowing that we have to maintain that pace instead of, um, uh, in order to, I mean, I'm going to be retired by the time we replace the pipes that we're talking about replacing right now. We all I are. hope, I hope. <laughs> um, so, you know, knowing that that's the pace that we have to maintain because that's the vision that we've set out as opposed to we just need rates because I need this amount of money. It's a different dynamic. And so it's really a luxury, to be honest, to be uh, talking about replacing assets on a life cycle basis as opposed to here's the capital that need that we identified. Uh, here's the amount of money it takes to support it. And then that, but that's a tw ten year, twenty year plan. So it wasn't it previously. It hadn't been sort of a back solve from the it end of useful life. No, the, we hadn't thought it. about it as a painting the Golden Gate Bridge, which is what we're doing now, uh, except this pipe in the ground. Um, Got it. Yeah. Um. Great. Yeah. Then I think. Then I think I'll. Like I said, I'm. I think it's it's one A one B. Sorry, one B. If we get the one point six. Fair enough. Rate. Um, and, and to, to my mind are all completely reasonable ways to proceed. Thank you. Commissioner Scharf. Yeah, I think staff's recommendation is extremely reasonable. I would definitely support the, uh, the two. I don't think I'd support one or one A as much. I, I don't definitely don't think we should be bonding in, in, um, with these interest rates. And, um, so I, I think staff's recommendation is the right way to go. Any other commissioner comments? Sure. I just want to, I guess, point out we often focus on the percentage. I'm, I'm, I don't know, but six dollars. That's why we put the number in there. Yeah, exactly. Um, you know, for a, for a, it, for restaurants, it's much worse. Right. Um, but I'm, I'm not sure. You know, the difference between four dollars, five dollars, and six dollars is super material so i like i said that's that's why i think 1a is could still completely be on the table if staff is ready to go you know i don't think the um the six dollars is real is real that it's the average person in palo alto doesn't really exist 
So for some people, that's a much bigger increase. And for other people, it's a smaller increase. So, you know, I think it depends on, on what you have. I've never really liked the, when we, when we take it, and it may be less for sewer because sewer is not as variable, say electricity and stuff. But I've definitely learned that when we do electricity or we do gas and we say the average, it's completely different for a single family home versus an apartment. And so the numbers really don't apply to everyone. Any other commissioner comments? Yeah, I guess I would echo, I, I agree with staff recommendation. I don't, I, I worry whenever we delay these projects that the, the cost just increases and we're sort of chasing our tail and then we have to keep coming back for rate increases. And we, it just feels like we never catch up to ourselves, and these projects get thrown off as long as uh, the staffing limitations have been addressed. Um, and I'm also concerned as uh, customers, both commercial and residents start recycling more water and keeping more water out of the pipes that old pipes will have more problems. And so I don't wanna to delay too long getting that going. Any other feedback? Right. Thank you. Thank you. I think we're going to move right on down to item three. Are there any public comments to item three? If there's anyone of the public who wishes to speak, please raise your hand. Or if you have a cell phone, hit star nine. I see no hands raised. Do we have a presentation on this? We do, Chair Siegel. So um, we wanted to have a discussion with um, with the commission tonight about, um, as all of you know, that uh, it's been 2018 when we first started our strategic plan. And uh, we felt uh, that it's starting to look a little different on how our priorities are and the directions that we needed to go. Plus also too is we have, quite a few um, newer employees. Um, so we thought that it's time to kind of update um, and then also give the commission an idea of, of some of the things that we've been able to accomplish over the last um, four years or so um, with this plan that we have in place. So tonight um, I have with me staff from each of the four areas um, that we identified um, Back, um, back in this 8, 2018 plan. And so what we wanted to do was talk with you tonight, um, get your input on this. We do, we'll, we'll probably end up bringing this back um, to you again. And then we want, also wanna take it and get adopted by council. Um, so that's our goal. But tonight we just wanted to have a, a conversation with you, get your thoughts on this as, as we're moving forward. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Anna Wong, who is um, the lead in the workforce group. Hi, good evening, commissioners. Um, so the uh, 2018 uh, strategic plan included four uh, priorities. And one is the workforce and collaboration, um, technology and finance. So tonight I'll be, work, I'll be speaking to you all about um, the workforce uh, priority. So for the workforce priority, our mission was to create a vibrant and comp competitive environment that attracts, retains, and invests in skilled. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. Thank you. Uh, and invests in a skilled and engaged workforce. Thank you. Um, and to meet that mission, we have established some strategies. Uh, one is to establish CPAU as an organization where employees are proud. Uh, to work and recruit other strong performers, uh, create a workplace that attracts and retains skilled employees, and then evaluate and consider alternative workforce solutions to achieve organizational um, business objectives. 
uh, what we don't have here is uh, salaries and benefits because you know salaries and benefits is something that uh, is not something that the, the workforce committee would be able to address. It's something that the union and the city negotiates on. Um, um, but but uh, so in the past uh, few years, um, we did accomplish a couple of things. So we have established a system operators training program. Um, and we have three that successfully accomplished a uh, finished the program, and we have hired three new recent um, trainees. And there's currently one vacancy uh, that's um, being posted currently. Um, we also have uh, established or we're developing a we've de developed one of the training and career progression um, for water, water, gas and wastewater engineering engineers. And this is important because um, employees come here for growth and opportunity, right? And be and working with uh, employees and together with them about their career and their career goals is um, something that uh, we find that is important to continue. Um, we've created a position vacancy tracking system with HR so that we are, prioritize our vacancies and recruit the positions that are um, keep the critical positions that are um, fresh as well as uh, hire for the ones that you know, are, are newly vacant. Um, we also have a list of uh, places where we advertise and a, a outreach strategy guide, as well as a timeline for our hiring managers, because they, when they are aware of what the when the hiring managers are aware of what the timelines are and the expectations of what it takes to hire an employee, um, they um, would be able to help um, meet some of these um, expectations and, and uh, provide this information ahead of time. Um, we've also executed engineering and construction contracts to augment engineering and operation staff. So that would be like our engineering design contracts as well as the overhead and underground construction contracts. Um, we also uh, have attended in-person um, college career fairs, uh, such as at Sac State and Cal Poly San Luis Obispo. We've hired three electric engineers from there. Um, and we've successfully implemented the remote work schedule for some specific work groups, such as um, resource management and admin, um, working on a hybrid schedule. And some of the initiatives we have in, in progress, um, once we've cemented that template uh, for the water, gas, wastewater engineering, the training and career path, we want to be able to um, spread that uh, to the other divisions and work with them on their career goals um, with, for the whole department. We'll conduct an employee satisfaction survey so that we can understand where um, where our, uh, hear from our employees and then uh, you know, and really understand what's important to them. Um, promotion readiness survey evaluations um, that is to, to part of our to develop the succession plans um, and we're also looking at digital recruitment ads we have one posted at uh, along the highway 101 at the ikea board um, if you drive by maybe you could take a look just <laughs> and um, it's going to be up there for uh, three months um, we're also working on ways to share team building ideas. You know, I think one of the things that COVID highlighted is that in person or just connections with your uh, with your colleagues is really important, and um, and it's um, it builds morale and camaraderie, uh, and it's important to keep that continue that so we don't feel like we're um, just here to to work. I mean, well, we are here to work, but <laughs> but we want to enjoy our time here. <laughs> yes. And so we're also looking at daycare options. Um, uh, we've, we're talking about, we've had a conversation with the city manager and we're um, exploring how we can um, collaborate with the local daycare um, uh, centers for the young families here at the city. Okay. So in the next slide here is our key performance indicators. One of the things that we established was that we'd like to be able to keep our turnover rate at less than 10% um, by 2020. So, um, but I have a three-year average from 2020 to 21 and then 22. And uh, our turnover rate has actually been uh, under 10%. Um, so that we have been able to achieve that goal. 
Uh, the next one is that 90% of all positions filled annually. So we have not been able to do that. Um, and then you'll see in the next slide where the vacancies are. Uh, we've been at some are 80, 81 to 85%. And the 100% of critical positions filled within 90 days. I don't even have a KPI there because that's not, it hasn't been possible. Um, it's really a competitive market for the engineers um, as well as the linemen. And uh, salaries is one of the biggest things, uh, benefits as well. Um, but you know, what we uh, we we did actually do we did do a survey of some of the folks at electric operations, and um, we do they they have informed us that um, the as I mentioned the training and growth opportunities and uh, the camaraderie and the um, uh, working with our colleagues is teamwork is, is really important to them too. Um, so we're also focusing on that. I'm um, sorry. So the hundred percent of critical positions, it's, it's just not possible um, to fill within 90 days. And um, we're, we're, we are working on that. And I think this last slide here is about some of our statistics. Uh, this is our vacancies by division. Uh, as you can see, it's still electric operations um, is still, the the winner <laughs> sorry is the is the division with the highest um uh, group with the highest number of vacancies and um uh in in 2022 the gray bar we have electric engineering um up at nine and then um, we have water gas waste water um as the next division that has um, the higher number of vacancies as well um, in the past three years, you know, we did uh, look at the metrics there. We hired 54 new hires. And actually, if I go back to my uh, previous slide, we also hired, we also had separations to, I think it was 40, 48 was the number. So even though we've hired new people, we still have um, folks who have left. So they, um, we're not really making headway in terms of vacancies. But you know what we do have, what we can see here is that we have had 94 promotions. And that's internal promotions. So we are working on. Um, I mean, it's proven that we have worked with our uh, current staff and um, in developing them and helping them with their career here at the city of Palo Alto. And that's um, that's it for my slide. Too many questions. Thank you. Any commissioner comments or questions? Yes, Commissioner Matt. Yeah, hi. First of all, thank you for your presentation. Um, obviously, the recruiting is a big challenge, as Director Bachelor has talked about in the past here. Um, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about uh, details of collaboration with educational and other institutions and companies that is you know described in the uh, presentation you know how's that what are we doing how's that going especially uh, are there target institutions like target you know you know companies I've worked at you know there are certain institutions where we can hire engineers especially easily right you know are there specific institutions universities do we have recruiting events ongoing relationships with faculty and you know executives at companies or community colleges whatever maybe you could talk about you know what we're doing that because obviously this is a big problem sure um the uh so we have tried to speak with um, some colleges, but in the past, back in when we started a workforce committee, we didn't really get very far. And then recently we haven't um, been able to pick that up, but that is a, a very good um, a point. We, we will be working with colleges as well. So we do have, we do attend the college career fairs, right? The Sac State and Cal Poly. We have attended Sac, um, San Jose State as well. Um, Lyman College is another place, but they have more uh, apprentice, I think, graduates. And um, at the moment, we wouldn't be able to take them. But we do, we do have current uh, constant communication with them. Um, and one of the initiatives that we will have is to work with some of the colleges, some of the counselors um, at the colleges to figure out what kind of um, programs that they have that is suitable for entry level positions in, in our engineering group and our operations as well. Um, but those are still in the works. Um, we haven't, we don't really have anything concrete. What about in the operational side? I mean, the biggest gap, right, was 
was below, I mean, the engineering was the second biggest gap and the biggest gap was more at the operational level. Electric operation, Other yeah. organizations we could be working with or are working with to, you know, uh, identify and attract those people. So we have, uh, you know, we, we constantly work with, and it, it's, it's a competitive market, um, as we've talked about. We, you know, we work with NCPA. Um, you know, we work with SCAPA, which is down south. Um, you know, we uh, have uh, kind of backed off a little bit from the Lyman's College up in Orville. And the reason for that is, is that uh, we find that uh, uh, young men and women come there. Uh, they pay for their um, 15, 16 weeks of training. They want to be hired, but they're hot, but these folks are all over the country. So once we've we hire them, they become an apprentice. They work their four years, and then now they want to go back home. That's happened to us three times. So <clears throat> we've decided that it's probably not the best place for us to go because um, they have three different um, campuses. They have one in Idaho, one in Oroville, and one down in Texas. And like I said, we have not had one stay with us. And um, so I've made a conscious effort not to really go too hard there. Um, the, uh, they, they do have um, good people when they come out um, for those 15 weeks. The training is really good. We, use, we do utilize them for other types of training for our own personal linemen um, and apprentices that we go to, but um, actually using them as an outsource for um, – bringing folks in is just not, I don't think it's a really good thing for us to be doing. But we have, um, as Anna mentioned, uh, we have been going to more uh, uh, college um, recruitments um, when they have, and we've actually made some now, we've actually made some headway to actually meet with their facility folks. Um, so for the some of the professors that are in their um, areas, uh, we've been able to talk to them and sit down and, and have some frank conversations with them about what we're looking for. Uh, we are also looking at um, moving into the high schools um, where we actually want to look at from some high school um, students because we do have um, what we call an, a, a, a helper's classification that's in the operational side um, that can actually learn the trade. He or she can learn the trade, move up, um, become an apprentice. Hopefully they will stay with us um, they're familiar with the area because they they're living here, so we're we're looking at that as well. Um, we do not um, we haven't really looked into uh, your question around other companies, other engineering firms, and things like that. We have not had any conversations with uh, with them about that, um, and uh, we've done some out search with outside um, recruitment firms um, that have. Uh, opened up the areas of where we're actually looking, um, but we have not found an engineer or alignment out of that. Um, those folks, uh, we've used two different firms. Uh, we have found a few uh, for the water, gas, wastewater. We have also found one from electric for a different type of position, but not the ones that you see where the larger numbers are at. Like community colleges or something like that. The, uh, We're just starting to reach out to the community. Us, we've know. we've gone to Foothill. We've gone to Kenyatta. Um, <clears throat> so we've kind of looked here so far, but we haven't really been that. I guess we haven't been that aggressive um, with some of the other ones that we need to look at. Okay, I mean, because it looks like this is getting worse than in, in the past year. Right. Um, I mean, the, the experience I have, and I'm not in the HR, you know, space, but every company I've worked in has always had a kind of uh, set of uh, companies or educational institutions that they target, mm -hmm. you know, like Johnson Controls targeted, uh, San Luis Obispo did not target Stanford or, right. or Berkeley. Well, the reason why we go and we target off of Sac State and off mm -hmm. of San Luis Obispo is they have a power engineering um, right. degree. Um, and there are electrical engineers that come out, um, but it's more of on a civil side. Um, so um, we don't really have hit those type of colleges, but that's why we want to start with the junior college portions of it, because at least they're getting their basics. And that's where we think that we can take uh, maybe a person that wants to be in college only for those two years, and then we can offer them, um, you know, some internships, some guidance, and, and then hire them on at that point. Thank you. 
Any other commissioner? Commissioner Forsell? Along the same lines of um, perhaps naively, but with good intentions trying to suggest uh, recruiting outlets. Um, what, what's the union that represents the line workers? Is that SIEU? Yes, it is. Because I've, I've, for other um, unions that represent other trades, I've learned that they have substantial training facilities and training programs. Is that something that SIEU can partner on or offer in any way? We've had some conversations with them and um, the unfortunate portion of it, SEU is not a utility backing um, union. Um, if you look at the other uh, 15 um, cities in, in the NCPA, they're all backed by IBW. That is the go-to. Um, IBW has all types of trainings. They have facilities around um, and, uh, uh, but unfortunately, SEIU does not have any of those type of facilities and they don't have uh, any uh, sources out there that um, can bring in the people that we're looking for. We've actually gone to IBW and asked them if they'd be willing to help us with some of the training or, um, and uh, they give us a little bit of training um, for our gas folks. Um, we do some welding through them, some field service. We, they won't let us into their apprenticeships any longer. Um, they won't let us into any of their um, apprenticeship trainings. Uh, we can't even get a person to come in there for how to teach them how to climb a pole. Um, because they're worried about the other union issue of SEIU, but they also understand that uh, they do help us out in some of the other trainings again, but unfortunately it's in the water, gas, wastewater side. Is this a disadvantage to the city of Palo Alto and an advantage to the other cities that work with IBW instead of SEIU? You know, I, 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 I want to say yes, but that's not true because the thing is that they're suffering as much as we are. Other cities, Roseville is having difficulties. You know, Santa Clara um, doesn't usually have problems because they end up usually taking our folks. Um, you know, so it's it they use us as a training ground and then they jump and go to Santa Clara. So, but Santa Clara, uh, but Alameda, I know is having difficulties. Uh, there's two up north um, agencies that are having problems with linemen as well. And they flip flop back and forth from pg &E and back to them, back back and forth. So I think what ends up happening is part of it is around salaries. So whoever has the higher salary, that's where they go to for that contract. And then they'll jump back over into the city at that point. So I, I don't think that it's just us. I think it's the industry as a whole. Thanks. Fair enough. And I am i don't think it's the job of the UAC but I will state the obvious if we're not paying as much as the other utilities. It, it seems like an obvious, um, the difficult thing to overcome in recruiting. Vice Chair Johnston. <clears throat> Just following up on uh, Commissioner Forcell's comment. What, how do we fill that void uh, now, we obviously have work that needs to get done by these people that we would otherwise hire. Are we doing it through uh, outside contractors? Are we doing it through overtime of our existing people? How do we fill that void? So we have, uh, we do have some contracts for on the lineman side. Um, and uh, we've opened that contract up as far as actually responding to emergencies um, along with our crews. Um, but our, the issue is it's very expensive. It's about two and a half times more than what our alignment would actually be making. Um, but there's no other, other source. Um, and, you know, you would typically bring on a contractor to work some CIP work and then you finish the project and you let them go and so on and so on. We can't do that. They're actually doing maintenance work for us right now. Um, we keep them around basically all the time. Um, and they respond, um, and, They've also, we, part of the contract was that they would have to help some of our younger folks. So some of our apprentices will actually be working with that crew as they're doing some of the work um, for us. And they've been fine with that. And it's actually worked out as a pretty good partnership in, in that part of it. So um, engineering, you know, one of the things that uh, we've talked about and we'll 
talk a little bit more about this as, as we move forward is, is just around the electrification and the modification of the grid. Um, you know, there's no way that uh, even if we were, we were fully um, full with all the engineers and all the operational folks that we'd be able to take that task on. So, you know, we're going to contract, we're going to have to contract that engineering work out, most likely do a design build portion of it to bring in contractors to rebuild some of the system. Um, and so I think the thing is, is that we're just going to continue down this path right now for using contractors to support um, our day-to-day -day operations. Have we tried to kind of quantify the cost of, of these vacancies by, you know, if you're, if you're saying we got to pay two and a half times outside contractor, what we would pay a, a, an employee, there must be a way to kind of quantify that cost. And, uh, and I know the whole salary issue is really complicated. It's not a simple thing, but if you, if you look at the, what, what you'd have to increase salaries to, to be able to fill the vacancies versus the cost of paying outside people to do this work. I just wonder if there isn't a, a case to be made there that we would save money by increasing the salaries. So we are working, you know, as um, as we are speaking, um, SEIU and the city are at the table right now negotiating salaries, compensation and, and others. And so uh, we have done that comparison um, and given those salary ranges to um, HR. Um, uh, we've also um, have heard from council members, um, you know, asking us, what do we need? What, what is it going to actually take to get us to where we need to be? And so uh, we're hoping that during this negotiation, the negotiation time frame with SEIU that we'll be able to settle some of this out um, and look at these costs that, that we're already incurring. And if, if Santa Clara is successful in kind of taking our people, <clears throat> that, there must, that must provide a benchmark for what you would need to to offer to, to get those people or to retain them. Santa Clara is part of the benchmark for us, um, but then there's also other surrounding like Alameda we use, uh, we use Roseville, um, and then we use, um, I believe it's Burbank, but I'm not clear on that, I shouldn't say that. Um, but there is about five different agencies that we'll do comparisons with. But um, so when you do that, you take out the high and the low, and then we're right there in the medium portion of it. And so. That's been the focus point with HR is to talk to them about, you know, maybe that's not the right way we should prepare, at least in the utility um, on the electric side. So uh, just to kind of reiterate the obvious here, we know that this has been a historic problem and we know you're working hard on it, uh, but it, it's obviously something that requires a continued attention. So thank yes. you. Any other commissioner comments? Before you go, just on a on a different part of the workforce topics on the uh, recruitment ads. Do you have a mechanism to measure success? So, like, are you asking people who submit a resume how they heard about the job? Yes, yes, we do. Um, on their application, there is a how did you hear about this um, job posting? Um, so there are, they can either, I think there's a drop down button for the posting boards that we use, as well as a free, um, uh, free text where they can uh, fill it in. Great. It'd be interesting to hear back yes. what's successful at Just some point down the line. Anything else? Um, yeah. May I? Yes. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks so much. Um, uh, Director Bachelor, I was um, intrigued by your discussion about the Linemans College, and I know one of the things that we're doing right now with um, the fire department, where we've had similar, you know, vacancy issues, is um, bringing people on sooner. And I believe we're paying for some portion of their training. Um, is that similar to what you're already trying to do, or is that a lever that you know the department has not yet been able to utilize? So that's um, one of the items that we we're thinking about. If we go to the high schools and we were able to find somebody that might be interested in becoming a lineman, then we would send them to that 15 weeks, pretty much like what the fire department does now. Um, they would send their candidate to that training, then that individual would come back to us and so on and so on. And that, that mechanism would work. But 
um, what we had found prior, these in these individuals are actually paying for their training, and they're they're waiting for an us or someone else to pick them up from afterwards. Right. So I think that your point is uh, well taken. Is that if we can start going to the high schools and and getting some of um, people involved with thinking about this might be a career. Um, and then we push this out or even at the junior college level, push this out to them. And then we could utilize them as a training course. We could. Okay, great. Thanks. Thank you, Ms. Hong. I think we'll take a short break now. It's 7.32. Let's come back at 7.45. Thanks.
Welcome back. I think we'll move on to priority two, collaboration. Good evening, commissioners. My name is Catherine Elbert. I'm the communications manager for the utilities department. It's nice to see you in person. I believe that a few of you were here at the table back in 2018 when we first came to you with this utility strategic plan. So it's nice to be able to see you again and uh, provide you with an update. The world has definitely changed since then. Uh, so collaboration is one of those buzzwords, I think, that is a little bit different than um, some of the self-explanatory names of the, the other priorities, perhaps. So I thought I would uh, just start us off by saying, what does collaboration mean? Well, it's to work with somebody to produce or create something. So we all know that we cannot operate in a silo on our own to accomplish anything, whether as a utilities department or as individuals. So that is why we are here to talk about how we are trying to work within the various spheres of our influence, such as community members, across city departments, within the utilities department, and then with outside agencies such as government, trade, and regional agencies. So those are the four main strategies that we have identified as part of the collaboration priority. We do have our mission for the collaboration priority, which we established back in 2018. And again, it's just working with those different stakeholders to talk about, recognize, and achieve our shared objectives. So that involves a lot of coordination, communication, education, and of course, our delivery of services. Next slide, please. So when we look at some of our recent accomplishments that have been identified within these spheres of influence and the groups that we are working with, um, a lot of these will not be a surprise to you. We have brought these before you uh, over the years. They have been many, prior, many prior, prior priorities um, and policies that we've asked you to endorse, give us guidance on, programs, et cetera. And I wanted to just call out some uh, result that we heard from a recent customer survey that City of Palo Alto Utilities customers cite that local decision making is one of the most important justifications of being served by a municipal utility. So you are doing a yeoman's work here in helping to guide us and then we can take your direction to City Council for defining the policies and the programs that we can deliver to the community. So within these accomplishments that we've identified, of course, as I mentioned, many of these will not be a surprise to you. A major focus has been on sustainability, the sustainability and climate action plan. Uh, folks here in this room have been working very hard within various areas of the, of the SCAP to put together some um, key initiatives and work plans. And we've um, really made some great strides as to even having council approve those on October 3rd. So you'll also hear some folks in the technology group talk about some of these items that I'm going to call out, uh, such as a lot of the work on the fiber optics program. There's been a lot of talk about that and what we're going to do to roll that out to the community. So we've launched a fiber optics hub to engage the community in these discussions. We've also had uh, one of the most severe droughts on record. And so uh, our team has been working across city departments to establish a water task force, also work within the community to offer education and resources, and make sure that we uh, get the community to buy in to the fact that this is a team effort. So interdepartmentally, we've also been working with groups like our planning and development services on streamlining permitting for things like solar and battery storage. And of course, with fiber optics, we're not just operating as a utilities department, we're involving the city manager's office, we're involving the information technology office, and then even a lot of our, uh, some of our other work extends to other groups such as customer service, our resource management and billing and how that all rolls up into um, how that's going, so a program like fiber and others will be rolled out to the community. Green building and reach code, again, as part of our sustainability focus, uh, we've made some strides in those building code cycles. And then, also thinking about how a lot of these programs and initiatives will impact folks in other utilities divisions. Thinking about the impacts to the electric grid as we're talking about building electrification and electric vehicles and what are those impacts. 
We've been establishing some meetings to make sure that we are collaborating and we're thinking about the engineering and the operations impacts. Also related to not necessarily related to the drought, this has been a long time in coming, but the One Water Plan does touch, touch on drought as we're looking at climate change and the impacts to our long-term water resources supply and resiliency. So that's been a great focus that our team has been working on. And then, of course, we continue to meet with various groups such as CMUA, NCPA for legislation, advocacy. We partner with agencies such as Valley Water and the Bay Area Water Supply and Conservation on drought water supply, conservation, and then also um, due to climate change, we've seen um, a higher risk of wildfires. So we're trying to think about how we work with our regional partners on the best responses. Next slide. So some of our initiatives looking forward are um, continuing our focus on sustainability. So this Saturday, we have a workshop that's titled Making Better Choices in, our, in Your Home, which is really focused on Beneficial electrification. I encourage anyone to come out. It should be a great event. Uh, demonstrations, great information out there. So this Saturday, um, we're going to be demonstrating some of the programs and the resources that are available to the community. And we're continuing our, on, on that education path to get information into the hands of our community members, such as through energy and water workshops, both in person and virtual. We did have to pivot, of course, during the pandemic and figure out how we were going to deliver that information. Um, and then, of course, we talked about the continued collaboration with various departments, such as our planning and development services for sustainability and reach code development and the building electrification. And then uh, some of the new uh, initiatives that um, actually we it's not um, something that we can highlight. We say with well, this slide was created um, a little bit earlier. We have launched the Water Smart Portal and Home Water Reports program, and we're happy to announce that we have integrate that, integrated that with a single sign-on feature through My CPAU. So a utilities customer can log on to their account management system, and they can immediately get access to information on our water programs, our energy programs, and this is going to deliver great great information such as leak reports, et cetera. And again, you'll probably hear Dave talk about this in the technology group, but uh, working on various technological enhancements such as advanced metering infrastructure and our outage management system, we're not just um, handling that in, in a vacuum in the utilities department. Uh, we, uh, not just one, one division of the utilities department, we also have to think about the impacts to customer service and those who work on our outreach, et cetera. Again, billing and resource management. And then of course, we talked about this in the workforce group, but we are going to continue to collaborate with and try to enhance the work that we do with educational institutions and companies to try to recruit and retain a vibrant, uh, talented workforce. And then um, climate change is, as we know, is not going away. So um, the regional collaboration, I think, is going to be um, really important for us to be successful in how we approach that. Next slide, please. So in 2018, we identified the following as our key performance indicators. We're in a different world now, as I mentioned earlier, so we are going to be revising or evaluating these and um, asking ourselves, are these the best KPIs for collaboration moving forward? We struck out on a limb back in 2018, so this is what we identified, so I'll talk a little bit about these. First of all, we identified that we'd like to make sure that our customers are aware of the programs. So that's perhaps a gauge of how well we are getting the information out to the community, how well we are collaborating with people on there. Um, so uh, we established a benchmark of 50% uh, or higher customer awareness for our customers. And uh, we've gauged that through one of our most recent surveys through the California Municipal Utilities Agency. Um, RKS was the vendor who conducted that survey on our behalf, uh, asking, asking our customers how well they were aware of our programs. And we did find that customers continue to um, identify that they are aware of our programs more and more. Uh, of course, those who have participated in our programs are aware of more that we have to offer. We found that the highest percentage are perhaps those who have participated in our home consulting audits, such as the Home Efficiency Genie. We've also found that customers who participate in our programs uniformly um, rate the utility 
with a higher satisfaction. Just want to let you know that, about that. Um, and then the other KPI that we that we identified was uh, our general customer satisfaction. Of course, that's a traditional bottom line for establishing how well an organization is doing. So we we selected a percentage rating that's somewhat old, comes from um, previous previous um, versions of our utility strategic plan. And this is something that we're going to have to think about uh, because we did see a decline in the percent rating for customer satisfaction in the most recent customer survey, but that's declining across the state for both municipal utilities and IOUs, the independent operator utilities. So we wanna ask ourselves why? What is happening? What is the trend? Now, of course, the world took a tailspin a few years ago when the pandemic started and um, a lot of things changed. But in general, we're seeing a decline in customer satisfaction for utilities. Um, I will say that municipal utilities continually rate higher than IOUs, though. So that's important to note. I think that's a, a nice feather in our cap. Um, I would like to also note that, that during our last customer survey, it followed a series of large power outages. So understandably, perhaps the responses we received might have been slightly skewed by some singed memories of <laughs> some, uh, some unpleasant experiences. Now, of course, We've talked a little bit about um, what's happening with the electric operations and outage management system, and we're making strides in that area. We definitely know that's an area we want to improve. So anyway, we can dig into that a little bit more. Um, I would like to say that uh, we, we think that we're in a new world. So I chatted with Dean about this, about how we, we should really reevaluate these KPIs. And are these the benchmarks that we want to use moving forward? So. For example, I mentioned that customers who have participated in our programs uniformly rank us higher than those who have not participated in our programs. And in fact, uh, one of the other results of our recent survey denoted that half of our City of Palo Alto Utilities customers recognize that there's a great benefit from having a municipal utility serve them. And that's up 44%. Um, from, uh, from 2018. Most City of Palo Alto Utilities customers um, believe that we communicate at the right frequency. I would call that a win. And those who have participated in our surveys, um, and I'm sorry, in our programs, most notably the Home Efficiency Genie Survey, oh, ranked us with a net pro pro promoter score of 90 which I think is pretty remarkable. So that demonstrates some pretty great satisfaction and we wanna to continue to raise the awareness about our programs and continue to encourage folks to participate. So would a net promoter score be one of those KPIs that we might want to identify moving forward as a good benchmark? That's one to consider. We also want to perhaps ask ourselves, do we wanna ask customers, do we wanna ensure that we're meeting the needs of our customers in terms of energy, electrification, now that we're in this realm, sustainability, et cetera. And in 2021, in that survey, nearly half of the customers who responded did say that they believe that the City of Palo Alto Utilities uh, meets their needs for home energy and water efficiency. And that's an eight, per, eight point increase from 2018. So I believe that it's important for us to continue customer satisfaction surveys, but we might want to think about how we frame the questions and what sort of questions are we asking? Because I think the world has changed in terms of what customers want from their utility, what they need from their utility. So we're working with a new survey company right now in rolling out additional customer satisfaction surveys. Uh, and we'll continue to think about uh, What's the best, what are the best questions to ask? What's the information that we, that we want to hear? And then maybe we'll look at some of the percentage of the actions that we have um, initiated under the collaboration priority that we have been able to complete or in progress for this fiscal year. So looking at our current trajectory, we're at about a 50%, 50-50% complete and many in progress. So I will go ahead and pause there.
for any questions. Thank you. Any commissioner comments or questions? I'd like to make one comment. First of all, thank you for your presentation, Catherine. Also for the focus of this part of the presentation on customers. Um, and the comment suggestion I want to make is that, you know, in reviewing this uh, strategic plan overall, it seemed to be very uh, inward looking. I mean, for example, within collaboration, which is the only area that touches on customers, three of the four areas are not customers. And so my thought is uh, in the next rev of this, it would be a good idea to add a customer vector as mm -hmm. one of the focus areas. And in fact, to make that the first one um, and then explicitly address quality, meaning customer satisfaction as testified by the customer. I think that's really important, um, particularly with the, the ratings, which you know may be the same as other utilities, but Still, I think you'd say are not great and kind of declining. So um, I think that would be really important in, as we move forward to make that a bigger focus. Any other commissioners? No? Uh, Vice Chair Johnson, are you done, Commissioner Matt? Yes. Uh, I, I mean, I, I, this is obvious, but obviously um, electric reliability is critical. And I think one of the things you, you said that, <clears throat> that it's, it's, um, it's gone down, there may be two reasons for that. One is I think we have had a lot of uh, more outages, more frequent outages than in the past. And we've talked about that. <clears throat> but I think that um, uh, with the pandemic, people have become increasingly aware of how dependent they are on you know consistent constant availability of electricity without any interruptions and um, so uh, I, I'm not surprised to see this number but I, I, I don't think it's something we should say well we should lower our goal uh, I think we we need to uh, to continue to focus on trying to, to have you know, customer satisfaction by providing reliable electricity. So I know you know all that, so. Commissioner Forsell. I just wanna plus one Vice Chair Johnston's comments. Any other commissioner comments or feedback? Thank you, Ms. Elbert. It's nice to see you live. Sorry, I sent you way too soon. I know, no, I just Council sort of, Member Cormack. Thanks so much. I pop in and out trying to um uh, I just I'm trying to connect the dots here between, you know, some of what Vice Chair Johnston said, thinking about like the KPIs that show up in the in the budgets and things like that. And um in and while I appreciate the list of what's been accomplished, um, I think if this is to be a strategic plan, I would prefer to see things that look like, um, you know, seamless short application time for um, installation of solar and battery. Not we met with planning and, de and development, but how long does it take today if someone puts in an application and, you know, how would they, what would the net promoter score be on that? So um, that's what I would like to see in the next iteration of this is more, um, again, as, as Commissioner Met said, you know, sort of um, if you're if you're sitting um, in your place of residence, whether it's an apartment or a home, like from there in, as opposed to from the utilities out. And um, so that that was one that I wanted um, to mention. Um, I think also hasn't the city manager um, put together a welcome letter that goes to um, customer, um, anyone who moves and creates utilities. Did you wanna mention that as an accomplishment? Sure, 
The new customer welcome letter is a project that the utilities department has overseen for decades. And recently, the city manager's office and a few other departments wanted to collaborate with us on that. And so there was a period of time where the brainstorming was happening. What happening? What's the best way to roll this out? And we finally just finished that project. Yes. Yes. As of this week, we're ready yes. to roll. <laughs> and there was a, it didn't awful, make it onto the slides. Awful lot of number phone numbers for utilities. So understandably confusing. I'm sure I'm not the only person sitting at this table who gets, I literally just got one earlier tonight. Who do I call about, you know, fill in the blank. So I think that's another opportunity. Um, not just when people, you know, when people have a problem, I'm like, is it, you know, is it straightforward who they, who they call for what? So in general, I would prefer to see more um, outside in focus and, you know, appreciate the, the comments um, of the other commissioners. And then my final question is about the survey. Why, why do we do a separate utility survey when we already spend so much money on the National Citizen Survey, which has a whole bunch of utilities questions? The utilities department has historically conducted customer satisfaction surveys in the absence of other city surveys that go out from different departments. The National Citizen Survey is relatively new within the within the, the, the scope of how long utilities has utilized this as part of a KPI to inform our strategic plan. And so we are trying to make sure that we are collaborating with other departments and recognizing what surveys are going out to the community so that we are trying to not duplicate our efforts and we're collaborating on that and we are not inducing survey fatigue. That is definitely an, an initiative that we should add. Um, and I will just add that the citizen survey has a maybe a few questions about utilities, but it doesn't dig deeper into some of the elements that we find are important for informing some of the work that, that we do. So whether we can figure out a way to perhaps continue to merge those to really fully gauge what we, um, what we need, um, you know, I think there's some opportunities. So do I, okay, <laughs> thank you. Thank you. My turn. Good evening, Commissioner and Council Member. Uh, tonight, I will present to you the technology updates of our strategic plan. And since the pandemic, we know how important technology is and how it enabled us to all work from home and be safe. So thank you to the city, the community, and technology in general. So as the mission statement for the technology, as a reminder, is to invest and utilize technology to enhance the customer experience and also optimize or maximize operational efficiency. So we have five strategies underneath the technology priority. The first one is to develop a roadmap, a long-term and a short-term roadmap for both customer um, satisfaction and also operational needs. So I will give the highlights of that roadmap down at the end last slide. And on the next one, based on our strategic workshops back in 2018, I think the number one request was AMI. So I am proud to say that we are in the process of implementing. Now, it just depends on when those meters arrive, we can get it done quicker. But yeah, I think right now we're still on target to get it done, hopefully by end of 2024, which is what the original plan was. So we'll just have to condense some of the timelines, but hopefully they arrive by beginning of next year. Um, the next one is about enhancing customer engagement and satisfaction. So as a result of the MyCPAU portal, I think with, that was a great success. We have a high adoption rate, which I'll talk about later. The fourth um, strategy we talk about is about internal staff, about how to improve response time, operational efficiency, and bring better security for our SCADA systems and also for our staff and facilities. And the fifth one is to ensure and empower employees with technologies to make their jobs easier, better, and faster, and more productive, of course. And for some accomplishments I would like to highlight is the MyCPAU, MyCPAU. So this is the self-service customer portal that Catherine had talked about. That's, an, that's available to all residents and commercial customers and enables them to view and pay their bills online. It also has energy and water and energy conservation tips, 
Um, they can also assign it to guest users. We also right now have about 27,000 registrants out of 30,800 accounts, so which is about a 77% adoption rate, so which is a huge success. I think most applications might be 50 to be considered successful. So at 77, I think we're doing a great job and we're still enhancing it, like with the water smart portal, a single sign on. And then once AMI comes along as well and on bill financing, I think we will get more adopters down the road. The next one is the SAP upgrade. The city's been on SAP probably since 2003, mainly for the enterprise resource planning, which is your HR, payroll finance, just the basics. Um, and then in 2009, utilities moved on, on board with SAP, just to be we're an integrated solution. So we're not running separate systems and trying to reconcile numbers back and forth. But by 2017, I think we were at the end of life of our SAP support agreement. So we did go out for an RFP to look for a new um, ERP system and also a new utilities building system. So I think we did receive like 13 evaluations or proposals. We had spent thousands of hours evaluating, but at the end of the day, given the, the budget and also resources required to implement a new solution, we decided to stick with SAP and just upgrade it to the latest version, which is supported. So there were some wins in that one. There is like single sign-on now. They do have some mobile applications for like time card approval, PR releases, and does integrate a little bit better with some of our other systems. Performance has improved. So now we're trying to make it compatible for our new AMI system that's coming on board as well. So we're working on it, but it's a very expensive and complicated. <laughs> and then finally, we just finished implementing the AMI base stations. So these are like data collectors that's installed out in the field. There's 10 of them all spread out throughout the city strategically. There are ones at Maybell substation, East Meadow, Montebell Reservoir, Pierce Park um, pumping station and hail as well. So I think there's 10 collectors in, in these five locations and they're supposed to collect all 75,000 meter uh, data, alarms, events every day. For electric, I think we're collecting data probably every 15 minutes and for water and gas is every hour and even including alarms, leak alerts and tampering and whatnot. So kudos to the electric operations team for putting those up. Oops, sorry, no initiatives. Any questions on those three before I continue then? Yeah. Is the, are the AMI um, data collectors integrated into the new SAP system? They are, we are exchanging files, flat files. They're not live or automated yet. No, but that's a phase two. So that is in the works, but there is going to be a, a cost to it. So we're looking into that. We're deciding if we want to stay with the flat file exchanges or real time API. So that'll be probably in the second half of next year. We'll decide on that. But we do have a consultant on board if we decide to do so. And then for initiatives and progress, as you all familiar with the fiber backbone and the fiber to the premises, we have made great strides where we're at today. We've been studying this for 20 years. So kudos to everyone and your patience and your diligence in reviewing this. <laughs> we'll be bringing this back again in November to the UAC with some options to recommend the council. And then the plan is also to bring it back to council by the end of the year to also have a vote at the end to say what the next steps are. Um, the next one is the SCAP initiatives. Council just recently adopted the SCAP um, action and action and key plan, highlight plans. So, and also the heat pump water, heat pump water heater program. So we're also looking to do other new technologies like the rooftop uh, cooling and heating systems and future, greenhouse gas emission reducing appliances or equipment to help with our goal of, was it 80 by 30 reduction. And then we're also, as I said, SAP, we're still working on it. So we just implemented on-bill financing for the heat pump water heater program. So very excited about that, um, that you should be seeing on the bill if you subscribe to that. And you also see on the MyCPAU portal, there'll be like a, a tab for you to show what your payment uh, schedule is like or what, when it's due, the five-year term, and then also will show up on your bill. And then the deploying the 3,000. So this is the beta phase of the AMI project. We're trying to put 1,000 electric gas and water meters out in the field just to do testing of the systems and also make sure the billing is correct. 
So we'll do parallel build testing. We'll be reading the meters as well as collecting the data from the air. And then we'll still match up the two bills and make sure they are exactly the same before we roll out more meters. And then in addition to these beta phase routes, there's two routes out of 100 I think we've identified. We also want to start um, installing some of them for electrification studies and grid modernization. We're going to be putting them where there are like EV chargers, all electric homes, just to see what the load's going to be on those transformers. So I think we've identified like 350 locations that we want to collect data on. So to help with our grid modernization project. Um, new outage management system that just got approved, I think last week. So that's Millsoft Solutions. They are a reputable utility system. Um, we've worked with them in the past. So we're looking forward with this partnership. So with this new outage management, there will be much better communication both internally and externally. So you guys or people who are affected will get notices or texts or emails, however you choose right away. And there will also be status updates every so often. So those will be all pushed out automatically by the system. And finally, we are migrating our in-house GIS system to the Esri platform. The current GIS system is homegrown. There are lots of gaps, I guess. It doesn't integrate well with SAP, with AMI, with even the police, 911 dispatch. So we are starting to invest more in this Esri. It's gonna take a few years to get it ramped up and integrate with the other systems, but there's gonna be lots of rewards at the end of the road. We'll have mobile applications, we'll have web-based programs. So that should be something to look forward to. Any questions on the initiatives? Okay, keep rolling. Next slide, please. So it's a couple of KPIs here. Um, I think for the first one, it says increase my CPAU customer website user utilization by 10%, or actually in, increase adoption by 10% and utilization by 5% each year. I think we've flipped it around now, just because we're already at 77%, it's gonna be hard to get 10% every year. So I think we're gonna ask to change that to 5% a year is the goal for adoption rate. So like I said, we're close to 24,000 out of 30,800 accounts. And then for the paperless utility accounts only, we also have been trying to promote that to conserve paper and costs on mailing and whatnot. So we're at about 7,200 now customers that have paperless bills only. So the goal now is to grow that 10% every year. So I think right now we're at like 23% of paperless customers only. So I think we have room to grow there. And the second KPI that's listed here is paperless tools for field support staff. I think the goal was 50% by 2018 and 9% by 2019. I think because of COVID, we did fall behind a little bit on some of these initiatives. It was hard to get, um, programmers or vendors in to demonstrate. And so right now, engineer, we're still at 50%. The biggest reason for that is all the maps that they carry. So it's not on the electronic version. So once we get Esri upgraded, I think we can get most of that stuff online instead of on paper. It's just the as-built maps that they need in the field when they do their inspections or construction. And then for operations, we are using more mobile applications for like maintenance orders, service orders, so I think with AMI, we do have a new installation mobile software that we're gonna hopefully use post AMI. So that will hopefully bring up those numbers as well going forward. I had a question, if you, if you put all the maps on uh, technology, is there a added security risk? And if so, are we uh, trading those, uh, the staff who's using them because it's such a different job than, than they had before. Right, usually for those, we would have to connect to the VPN, so there'll be extra security. So it's as secure as working from your desktop almost, from your office. So we'll have to make sure it's like multi-authentication and put in those protocols. But will it be as easy for the field crews to log in and do all that? I don't know, so we'll have to see if that's, they'll adopt that or not and what the use rate will be. Just a related question about about maps. Is the is the desire for paperless tools coming from the engineering and operations crew? Yes. I okay. Think so yeah. Okay. So, also, so there's an active preference to to carry an iPad over a paper map. Yes. Got it. 
And also one thing is the service orders and maintenance orders. Right now, they have to write it down in the field and come back and enter it again into SAP. If we get these mobile solutions and they just press a button when they come back in the office and they'll upload into the system is what we're trying to get for them. Any other questions? I think the last one is just the roadmap we have. So for F2023, we have the outage management system that should be done by early or mid next year. And then we're also putting together a fiber management system. That contract just got awarded. This is to consolidate. I think we have three different systems right now for fiber management, one for customer service, one for engineering, one for operations. So by consolidating them all, make things a lot more efficient for both customer fulfillment and also for tracking and optimizing the network. And then down the road, we do have AMI demand energy responses and the MyCPAL will have some new features like the leak detection, but once we have AMI, outage alerts as well. And then finally, we'll continue working on CIS, which is our SAP for the utility billing system and the GIS ESRI I mentioned earlier, just to make things more modern and integratable. Any questions? I had one question. Uh, looking at the roadmap, I see AMI, uh, but is there a plan yet for using AMI for customer benefit? For customer benefit, yeah. Once we use it for like leak alerts, if you have I mean, is there like a roadmap? Uh, oh. In, in 2023, we're going to roll out this, you know, valuable thing for customers in 2025, something else. Right. And I think so right now, not distinctly that, but right now, I think what we're thinking, of course, leak alerts will be first thing and then time of use rates right after that. So those two things will be on the horizon once we're able to deploy those meters. Leak alerts will get right away immediately. And then the time of use rates, I think we're going to have to probably wait till everyone gets the meters and then we'll put together a pilot or a design by then. Okay. Just one quick question and forgive me, you might've said this as you were presenting and I just didn't note it. Um, for the alpha mm -hmm. program of AMI base stations, um, how many have been installed? Oh, we've done all of them. The, the original alpha was like maybe two base stations, but we've already completed the whole deployment of the base stations now. Right? What was that, 500? 10. Oh, 10 base stations. Okay. Meter wise, I think we're at 50 right now for Alpha. 50 okay. to 100. But the okay. goal, yeah, and the goal is to 3,000 for beta. Next year, yeah. Yeah. Okay, but there's already 50 to 100 out there. Right. And then can you talk a little bit more? I didn't quite understand what you meant when you said flat file exchange versus real time live. So flat, data, like where does that flat file live and how is it being exchanged? Sure. So the system collects all the data. At the end of the day, it generates a file. And then we would have to schedule it and send it out to the other system to receive it. So you put it on like an SFTP server and they'll have to pick it up and then ingest that data. Is this a person? No, no. It's all system automated. I see. But just a one day delay versus real time. Got it. Okay. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Any other commissioner comments, questions? Thank you. You're welcome. Good evening, commissioners. Jonathan Abenshine, Assistant Director with the Utilities Department for Resource Management. And um, I'm also leading the Finance and Resource Optimization um, priority in our strategic plan. Uh, so um, can I get the next slide, please? So this priority is about providing excellent utility services cost efficiently. And um, to know that we're doing that, we need to have clear objectives and understand what excellent utility services mean. Um, <clears throat> so a big part of this priority has involved reviewing our um, objectives in the areas of capital investment, sustainability, and resiliency, and closing any gaps where our objectives have not been as clear as we'd like. Now, that effort is still a work in progress, but I give you that introduction just to give you a, a clearer idea about why we chose the strategies that we did. And what you'll see here, and when you look at the strategies, is that strategies one and three are about 
clearly defining our capital investment goals and making sure that we're meeting them. Um, strategy two is about planning and communicating, uh, internally communicating our capital investment um, to make sure that we um, manage swings in investment because any capital program has, um, has swings in investment from year, investment needs from year to year, but we wanna manage those in a way that avoids sudden rate shocks. And then strategies four and five are about defining um, our sustainability and resiliency objectives. Now, all of these are huge work items. Um, there's been an enormous amount of work in the last few years on the sustainability and climate action plan. Um, a lot of work on resiliency and, and um, capital is a little bit under the, um, under the waterline, but um, a, a huge effort nonetheless. Um, some of the work that we've done has moved a little more slowly than we would have liked, uh, because in part because of competing priorities, um, but also because of limited staffing, particularly in our engineering areas, and particularly in electric engineering. To get the next slide, please. Um, we have made progress, though. First, we've uh, we develop a set of comprehensive infrastructure reports that we deliver once per year per utility in the quarterly report. And we're delivering those for water, gas, and sewer right now. Um, we're still working on developing them for the, the electric utility. Um, we want to have these reports to make sure we do a comprehensive review of our infrastructure investment at least once per year, um, as well as our maintenance. And what that does is it allows us to identify and address problems early before they become overwhelming, overwhelmingly expensive to solve or they start um, uh, um, impacting our. Uh, the quality of our utility service. And the sewer CIP item that you heard earlier tonight um, came out of this annual review process. Now we've done some benchmarking uh, already for our water utility. I believe there are several on the, utility, on the uh, UAC here who um, heard our last water benchmarking presentation. And we spent the last year working on bringing on consultants who will be able to benchmark additional utilities in the future. Now this does require staff time to implement and, um, but we're, we're trying to get the consulting infrastructure in place to be able to do these more in the future. Um, we have established, uh, with respect to strategy two, um, we've also established and funded capital improvement reserves for our water and wastewater utilities. Um, I'll talk a little bit more on the next slide about uh, what we're trying to do for electric and gas. We've studied our electric and water portfolios and our electric integrated resource plan. And, um, and we did several studies of recycled water culminating in our, um, in our uh, recycled water agreement with Valley Water. So we're continuing to look at ways to optimize our electric and water portfolios and achieve all of our sustainability objectives at the lowest cost possible. And we started, um, and this is a very hard topic. We've started the process of defining our resiliency objectives and there is definitely more work to be done on that topic. Um, and I, I think we've had multiple phases of that work. We've had discussions in the context of the Sustainability and Climate Action Plan. Uh, it's been a UAC priority. And we've also, um, and, and we have attempted to tackle that, I think in multiple, in multiple ways, made some progress, um, but I think there's a lot more work to be done. And while we were uh, working on all of these actions um, in parallel, and it's not listed up here on the, on the slide, but, we have been regularly reviewing our costs um, throughout the utilities and management team each year. We made some changes to our annual financial planning processes uh, to be able to do that review and work it into the budget. And uh, each year we try to identify cost savings we can implement and we share. And when we, when we accomplish cost savings or we have them in progress, we try to share them with you each year as part of our rate, um, rate design process, our financial forecasting process. Uh, next slide, please. Now we have, we have a lot of initiatives still in prog progress. Um, we're uh, like, as you heard earlier, we're uh, looking at whether to increase sewer system investment. Uh, we're continuing implementation of the capital reserve and budgeting practices that I talked about on the last slide, trying to expand that to the electric and uh, gas utilities. We're starting on a grid modernization effort 
to run uh, in coordination with the SCAP. And this is a critical and high priority item for us. Um, the Utilities Department has been a major participant in, in various interdepartmental sustainability efforts, uh, the Sustainability and Climate Action Plan and the One Water Plan currently in progress. And we're continuing to pursue the second transmission line uh, to increase resiliency, um, one of many elements of things we need to do to increase resiliency. And, um, and also working to mitigate potential wildfire risks by underground, undergrounding lines, uh, electric lines in the foothills. Now, at the bottom of the slide, you can see our performance indicators. And um, the most important is right up front. We want to make sure that people are seeing value in their publicly owned utilities. Um, and they want people that's expressed in having lower bills in the surrounding areas. The remainder of our uh, performance indicators focus on uh, defining our capital objectives and making sure we're keeping up with them. And again, the goal here is to make sure that as we try to keep costs down, as we try to achieve this first goal, we don't do it at the expense of the long-term health of the utility systems. We want to make real efficiency improvements, not cut corners. Uh, last slide. Here you can see how we're doing on our KPIs. Um, we have a lot of capital and maintenance plans, uh, updates in progress. So our, our capital investment plans are largely in good shape, especially for our gas, water, and sewer utilities. Um, our electric plan will be in good shape once we, estat once we um, finish our grid modernization study and have a, a plan for how we need to um, modernize and update our grid. And, and I think one of the the great side effects of this is it will be able to catch up on a lot of infrastructure investment that's needed to be done as part of this, um, this upgrade and increase in capacity that we're going to do. Um, the maintenance plans, uh, several, several, several of them are listed as being, uh, as having updates in progress, but I just want to note that those utilities um, already have robust maintenance programs, but what we're doing right now is updating them and making sure they're, um, we're looking at aspects of them that need to be changed. So these aren't overhauls or, or new inventions. And I'll just say that even with all of that investment, we're still maintaining rates at or below our average for our surrounding comparison communities uh, in the last, in the FY 2023 budget, which was adopted um, uh, in the spring. Uh, we, we, that's the last evaluation we did, we were showing 18% below the average for our surrounding communities. So that's my presentation. Happy to take any questions. I had one question, which is how is resilience a financial objective? It's a I finance. I totally understand the importance, but. Sure. And I think that's why we called it finance and resource optimization, because it's not just about achieving financial, um, it's not just about achieving uh, financial savings but it's also about def clearly defining what our objectives are for utility services and resiliency is central to that. Okay. Um, and achieving improvements in resiliency and providing those services requires significant investment. And so that's what this priority is all about, balancing the needs for investment against the um, objectives that we want to achieve. Okay. Thank you. Any other? Commissioner Forcell, I have a, a super small question. When you, you you said we would all remember the water benchmarking study, was that the one comparing water rates between city of Palo Alto and there were five like five or six yes. other cities and they were all cities, none of them were water districts. Th that's the kind of thing you're talking about. That's that is the one you're talking about. about. Okay. Yeah. Thanks for clarifying. Yeah, and that's the exact study I was thought we were talking about. I was talking about. Please. Thanks, Chair Siegel. Um, thanks so much, Mr. Robinshine. Always, always a pleasure. Um, I'm intrigued by the list of things under strategies that seemed a little bit more like tasks, frankly, than strategies. Um, and one of the things that isn't exactly called out there that I was thinking about is you know, one strategy could be how we use debt and then what are, you know, how we use reserves. 
and it's a little bit embedded in some of them, but that seems more like a strategy to pay for things, right, uh, correctly over time. If I think even about the discussion the commission was having earlier tonight about um, wastewater treatment upgrades and the use of debt, and you, you know, thinking about um, debt financing in um, conjunction with the life lifetime of, you know, what it is you're paying for. Just encourage you when you're doing your next go round to maybe um, up level a little bit from some of the strategies that were listed that seem more like projects and think about some things that are embedded that I think you all know and you do, but aren't necessarily called out and are real, you know, strategies in terms of, of financing things. Thank you. Right, I'm going to tag on to that because I can tell you that when I, I know for me, I don't think I'm alone when I'm looking at uh, different proposals that that the um, staff brings, I often flip back to what's the mission, what's the strategy to see how in sync they are and how, and in particular with funding right now, it's come up a few times and, you know, certainly the UAC hasn't gotten any kind of guidance or overall philosophy or strategy on that. Um, and. Yeah, sort of along the same line, sort of the one key performance indicator. Uh, well, this complete 100% of plan capital replacement per long term investment plan. I'm not really sure what that means and over what period of time, because it certainly seems like a lot of uh, uh, capital replacement has, you know, waxes and wanes and depending on, you know, what's going on with the budget and staffing and whatnot. And so I didn't really follow what that means and how you're measuring it. Would you like me to speak to that? Yeah. Yeah. So um, each investment plan and each maintenance plan that we have has a, a very long list of, um, of things that need to be done every single year or things that need to be um, uh, um, or, or areas of investment that we need or a pace of investment on mains or particular piece assets. Um, and um, the, when we, we, we wrestled with this in the KPIs because um, these lists are very long and we don't want to include every single maintenance or investment item in our, in our key performance indicators. Um, but we did find that there were places where we didn't have enough definition in what investment needed to be done or what maintenance needed to be done. So the strategic effort here was to make sure that we were fully defining and fully tracking everything that needed to be done for our assets. And success is defined as us actually meeting our plan objectives. Um, one thing we considered was whether we met our, uh, whether we executed on the projects that we said we were going to do. but we didn't feel like that adequately captured the need to do the investment that needs to be done, not just the investment that we know we can do with the existing um, uh, resources that we have. And so um, that's why this uh, wastewater plan has come out of this effort, because we sat down, we looked at what investment needed to be done with our wastewater system, not just at whether we were executing on the you know, the budgeted projects that we we had planned to do, but whether we were actually doing what the system needed. Um, and that's something that needed to be done. And it's something that we've worked on over the last few years. I don't know if that helps. Uh, Commissioner first, I'm gonna think about that. <laughs> okay. It, it makes sense to me. And I actually just wanted to give you positive feedback on that because Something I've tried to ex express in previous commission meetings is a sense I've had year over year where we defined a budget and then the next year we'd get some report saying costs were lower than anticipated and, and it was sort of as if it was a good thing, but it sort of always felt like it was because we hadn't completed the projects that we set out to do. So I, I actually really like this effort of, of, of defining the projects need to, that need to be done and then holding the utility to a standard of, of completing them on time. So for me, it makes sense. Um, and I, the sewer, the sewer one is a, um, great example of this in action to my mind. 
Thank you. And I know it's operational um, and I know it's very task-based, but it's one of those tasks that if there isn't an overarching discipline, um, which the strategic plan has been a helpful, you know, a helpful sort of guiding oversight area that it's easy for that to slip based on the, the situation and the constraints at the time, you know, if staffing is turning over or people, or there just isn't available, um, there just isn't available uh, staff to do the work, then you end up in the situations that, that you were talking about. So. Okay, I think what I would say is I, it's great to have that as a plan. I don't really know how you measure it since these are long-term and we know they're not going to necessarily be met on an annual basis. I, I think it's a, it's a great goal. And if it works for, staff to be in KPIs, that's, I don't have a problem with that. It seems more, seems a little more higher level than that, but um, that's fine. It's great. Any other questions, comments? Yes, Commissioner Forsell. Sorry, one more. Do you have an update on the second transmission line? It's been a while since we talked about that. Um, I can take a shot at this and Dean, maybe you correct me if I say anything off base, um, but we have, um, we have started, so we've, we've, we, for a while, we were looking at a partnership to do a um, transmission connection um, over uh, to the, um, to the West uh, with Stanford. Um, we've moved away from that as a focus and we've started submitting um, uh, applications into the Cal, uh, Cal ISO's uh, transmission planning process. Um, the, uh, the first application that we put in, um, uh, they, they had feedback for us. It wasn't selected. Um, and we're in the process of working with a consultant on submitting a, a, a follow-up application. Thanks, that's actually helpful. I didn't know there was such a thing as a CAISO transmission application process. <laughs> yes, Vice Chair Johnson. I, actually, I also was interested in the second transmission line. I, I was gonna suggest that as a topic to maybe talk about in a little more depth in a, in a future meeting because we haven't discussed it in a long time. Maybe you've said all there is to say at this point. Well, I'll, I'll leave that to Director Bachelor. If I can interject, I think we're all on the same page. I actually had it as a note to add, and maybe it makes more sense to um, agendize it for its own topic when it makes sense for you to bring it back to us. Any other? Well, thank you. Thank you. Great, with that, we'll move to commissioner comments and reports from meetings and events. Does anyone have anything they'd like to share? Okay, oh, I'd, yes. I'd just uh, like to thank Director Bachelor and Tabitha for the uh, recognition event uh, it was it was really lovely to <clears throat> have everybody there and to uh, meet some of our colleagues and fa face to face for the first time yeah thanks for mentioning that okay i think we'll move on to future topics for upcoming meetings i think number one is second transmission line any others uh, I was happy to hear uh, uh, Mr. Ewan say we were going to talk again about the fiber to the premises. Uh, I don't see it on the schedule, but um, is that scheduled for the, for the next meeting, February? Or I mean, in, in November? Okay, great. Any other topics? 
Well, I had a few questions about some of the topics that are listed, um, particularly like grid modernization, which is on the calendar for November 20, this year. Uh, will this be addressing the impacts of SCAP? I mean, you know, we had a commissioner memo on that question. And uh, so will it be the grid modernization address SCAP mandated housing, new housing, uh, IRA, <clears throat> the federal law, you know, all those sorts of things. I know this is, you know, mixed dogs and cats, but nevertheless, we sort of need to deal with it. Yeah, I, I think the thing is, is that this is more of an update on where we are with actual physical of the upgrade of um, and talking about what some of the needs that we've learned so far from the study that we had the consultant um, go out and actually look at the field um, uh, needs of upgrading um, the wires, the lines, transformers, things like that. It's going to be more uh, hands on uh, field um, field stuff. So it is not a uh, strategic discussion of grid modernization. It is, it is not. No, because it was my understanding that so, it was my understanding that everybody was looking for an update from what the consultant had found. Um, and that, uh, <clears throat> you know, if there was some estimation of looking at costs, um, what the next steps would be then at that point, where we, what are we going to do? So um, that was the uh, going to be the update. Okay. Well, I mean, that sounds very important too. Um, but uh, given all these balls in the air, like SCAP and housing and so on, uh, I'd like to suggest that we have a discussion on you know, grid modernization strategically as it somehow tries to take into account all those new kind of curveballs coming at us. Apparently, IRA has to have gigantic impacts as we're talking about heat pumps and such and EVs. I mean, it's, it's got to have massive impact on how we think about uh, grid modernization. Well, I think that that's part of that whole upgrade of what it uh, looks like from uh, what the system itself is going to be able to um, have uh, those um areas that will have to increase for these power um, surges that we'll have to look for. Um, because the thing is, is, you know, right now there are some of the parts of the system is fairly stretched. Um, we can offer a hundred percent of adding extra EVs in some of the areas. So, yeah, I think that um, as we've uh, mentioned through to the council <clears throat> that uh, the plant needs to be taken care of first, um, and then the strategic pieces and also more new um, programs will follow at that period of time. Okay. So I, I'm just suggesting we get that on the agenda as, as soon as you can. Okay. okay. Um, another one I had a question about is there, there are two on the list related to resilience. And I wondered what those are about. And there's resilience update on the calendar for December. And then there's something, projects with resiliency component to be scheduled. And what, what are those? So the first of all, let me back up to the grid modernization it is not going to happen on November. Um, there, this uh, meeting, I think, is going to take um, more time. So it's actually going to move to December um, and it's going to move with resiliency. So we had um, had done as um, Commissioner Metz, is, as you well know, probably talking to um, Lena Perkins from our staff is that we actually had a intern work through the summertime period uh, looking at um, what's some of the resiliency um, of what the system could do, how it could be um, improved around. So that part of we're actually going to share that report from that intern um, and look at, um, you know, what do we need to do to incorporate um, hardening the system and, and what are some of those options going to look like down the road? So that, that will be, that's part of that resilience. And I believe the other piece of the resiliency is actually the same. Okay. Am I correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So. We just need to take it out of the 2B. Oh, I see. Okay, so that's the same. Right? It's the same, yes. Okay. okay. And then I, I, uh, we have distributed energy resources to be scheduled. 
Do we are we getting close to scheduling that DER? Commissioners, yeah. this is Tabitha Boat, Thank right? You. The utilities administrative assistant. So what you're looking at down at the bottom is quarterly we give updates on that list of things so in the quarterly report there's a number of things that we give updates on um, the other items are items that we will be bringing so the one that says resiliency any items that have resiliency it's not necessarily the overarching resiliency as in the report that you're going to be getting december 7th it's in the future if we have items that we need to talk about that touch on resiliency. So that's kind of a reminder to staff that says, oh, we're gonna bring up something on the yes cap. Okay, that touches resiliency. We should make a report on that. It's not necessarily specific about resiliency and what we're doing because that is a very large overarching report. So it's items that touch on that. And the same thing with the DER, it's items that touch on that, it's not a specific item. Whereas like purple pipe, that is a specific report or bringing back um, the last 10 years update. That's a very specific report that staff's working on. Okay, so does that mean we are not having a discussion on distributed energy resources? We are, but that so we'll have to get back to you. But I am, I'm pretty sure that we are having a um, in the future, in the near future, um, well, we will have a conversation with about DER. Okay, yeah, yes, I, I, you know, I, I think that's very important, particularly with IRA and EVs and everything that's you know, jumped in importance. Um, another future topic I'd like to suggest um, for at some time in the next many months, um, I think it'd be great to have a conversation about capacity planning, um, both at the state level. I mean, the, the community is very concerned um, given the, the um, flex alerts and just kind of, it would be great to understand how the, how the state is planning state capacity. And then also locally for Palo Alto, our capacity planning for the increased loads with heat pumps and EVs and, um, and new housing and everything, just to have an understanding of sort of how Palo Alto is planning in the, in the context of the state planning. Any other topics for the future? Great, I think we've made it to the end. Um, does anybody wanna to move to adjourn? I move to adjourn. I'll second. <laughs> Great, thank you everyone. Have a good night. <laughs>